What's good, everybody? This is Ray Daniels, a.k.a. The Culture Referee, and I'm here to talk to you about Two Loss Distribution. They are one of the most technologically advanced distributors in music. They distribute to more stores than any of the distributors around. They distribute, uh, they give you 100% of your royalties. They only charge you $3 a month, and you have an instant option to get an advance from these guys. So if you're watching this and you want to be in the music business and you're trying to figure out how to get help, I'm here to tell you, go to twoloss.com and use the word gods as your coupon code and you get the first three months free what's up everyone it's your k verde and queen dream it's your cousin juju it's your fox bully from fox bully jack okay. dance he gotta be and this is ray daniels aka the culture referee i think that's that's gotta be a part of the show because it's like every time he sells he has a different intro like the simpsons have a different exit he has a different intro this is Ray Daniels, and welcome to the God Show. Let's go, guys. And today we have a very special guest, um, a really good friend of mine, uh, one of the smartest guys I know, uh, one of my favorite producers, and as you guys hear, you'll find out he's one of your favorite producers, too. The crazy thing, guys, I'm going to be honest with you, is I didn't think he was coming until he actually was here. It was kind of like Andre 3000 coming to give you a verse. It's like, are you sure he's coming? He's, I talked to his auntie, and he's on the way. I'm like, let's just not say nothing. But he showed up. And the first thing he said to me was, Ray, I'm outside. So we're going to have an co outside conversation with one of the biggest producers in, in, the, hit, in the world mm -hmm. who actually is the only person that I've ever met, and I never told you this, that told me he retired. Mm. Then when I flew to Miami to see you, you was like, Ray, I retired. I'm like, that, yeah. we can do that? I didn't even know we can do that. I've never <laughs> seen nobody do that. So everybody yeah. give it up for the legend, Salam Remy, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What up, what up? I cannot believe you're here, bro. Yeah. Why are you outside, man? I'm outside, you know, to to um, spread the joy and the goodness that can happen. And, you know, I'm glad to uh, be able to come on your platform. You know, I mean, you know, I don't go outside, but I look through the window, which is the gram. And I be seeing these <laughs> clips. Right. I'm like, look at Ray talking. Look at Ray talking. I'm like, all right, cool. So when I was coming to ATL, with my uh, museum that yes. I've been doing, you know, my art thing, which I'll explain more about. And, you know, my publisher Chanel was like, you wanna go see Ray? I was like, ah, I don't know. And then when I landed <laughs> and I looked out the window, I'm like, where Ray at? <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. when you got that call. Man, back. well, thanks for being yeah, on the so. show. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, for the people that don't know, like I know. For, okay, let, I'm not gonna even do that. So let me tell you who Salam is, guys. I get my first A&R real job at Epic. And the 32nd floor was where the bosses was. That's what L.A. had an office on the 22nd floor with us, but he had an office on the 32nd floor. Doug Morris had an office on the 32nd floor. Salam Remy had an office on the 32nd floor, a whole suite. And I would go to his suite, and I would, like, I would, be, I would come from A&R meetings, or about to go on one, and I would sit in his office, and I would just throw shit at him. And, he'll just, and it was like, no one answers like you. Like, no one answers like you. Like, well, you got to understand, they want this. You got, so I'm like, fuck. Bro, how did you become Salam Remy, bro? Um, more than anything else, I think I came from somebody that actually was me times 10, you know what I'm saying, mm. which is my pops. Yeah. So my pops, Van Gibbs, actually did all the things that I've done before me mm. and kind of gave me a good place to walk through. And then also at the same time, he left good name everywhere that mm. he was. Mm. So when I showed up as his son, I was embraced. So, you know, from being a musician, you know, actually how I was born was that my father was in a band with my uncle in Queens. Okay. Um, when he came, my pops came from Trinidad when he was 18. He was going to Queens College. My uncle you know, was doing bands all up in St. Albans, Queens, doing a lot of stuff. And then that's my mother's brother. So that's mm. how my parents met. Mm. And then when my dad was in the band, he was in the band, you know, it was my uncle Joe Wiggins, my other uncle Tommy Wiggins, Larry Smith, mm -hmm. you know, all that type of stuff. Then he went to Queens College with, you know, uh, the Marcus Millers and all a lot of the Jamaica boys, like the guys who was doing all the music out there, um, the Great Brothers and, you know, the Burt Reed from Crown Ice Affair who did Mad Classic Records. So he just, he was in the pocket in the scene and then, you know, made some records, he got jerked, so then he became an executive. He started, mm -hmm. you know, doing intern stuff as a grown man mm. at Arista Records, so he became the Northeast Regional. Then Jive Records shows up, so him and Barry Rice got history. Him and Sylvia Rohn got history promoting records, like different things like that. So then he was like, all right, cool, this promotion is cool, but I'm producing too on the side. So he was producing the Fat Boys and yeah. Curtis Blow and different stuff, so I'm helping him with that. Then he's like, ah, I need a label deal. So then he had Chuck Chill Out and Cool Chips on. 
and MC Rel. So when he did all these different things and then, you know, was managing people. But, you know, when I was able to now go live with my pops when I was 17, moving mm-hmm. from Queens, I moved to Manhattan. He had classic concepts, Ralph McDaniels, Lionel Martin, subletting pieces off his Chuck Chill Out was at the other end of the hall. Funkmaster Flex is driving Chuck around, so it's me and Flex everywhere. I stepped wow. into a very healthy hip hop space. Molly Mall stops by. Molly Mall lets me get some co production on Craig G. So I came into something that was really real, but also Pops had left, you know, so much good energy with different people that yeah. when they was like, Oh, you Van Son? Oh, all right, cool. Yeah. And I was able to walk into that, but then also having the knowledge that he left me with to multiply. Shout out to your pops. If anybody asks me, yeah, let me clap for him. That's it. Because I'm saying that to say that. Shout out to your pops because when people ask me, what am I doing to this day, the last maybe five or six years, my answer has been the same. I'm just trying to make sure that when my kids walk in the room, nobody treats them like shit because I was a good person to everybody. Boom. And hearing that, that that's the, the one thing that I, and I, I don't think I've ever told you this, but I love telling people stuff on camera because it's, it's good to give people their credit. The mm-hmm. one thing that I admired about you was that you never, like, the guy he is right here, it can be a war going on outside. Everybody got guns, and he'll be just like this. Look, this is what we're going to do. Because I got mine, too. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But, you, but I'm just saying, you're not going to raise your voice. <laughs> you're nah, not going to, cool. like, you're yeah. going to be I'm like, not, nah, look, I know what to do. So, right. so I, I just want to give you props for that. But as you were talking, I wanted to ask you one question. And by the way, y'all can ask questions, so I just got to ask, because you never seemed like you had a color. It was weird to me, like, like we know when producers are black producers, right? And mm-hmm. even when the white artist gets in the room with them, Robin Thicke is trying to get the sauce. That's why he's working with Pharrell. Mm-hmm. Like, Nelly Furtado needs the sauce. That's why she's working with Timbaland. You mm-hmm. aren't that. Your story is, you, you were kind of like, like the first time I heard your name was Amy Winehouse. Right. And then when I would say your name for Amy Winehouse, I would get checked by people like Akon. They were like, he was producing for the Fugees and Lauren Hill. I'm like, what the fuck? I, I didn't know none of this shit. And by the way, mm-hmm. he doesn't lead with it. So you gotta remember, imagine being in a room with him and you don't, you don't, he tells you nothing. <laughs> He's like that old man on the corner that you go see that gives you all the information and everybody love him and you don't know why. And then you go to the other corners, you was like, yo, I just got him from, from Salam. And I'm like, oh, did he tell you what he did that? What? Mm. Nah, you didn't tell me that shit. And I come to him, I'm like, why you didn't tell me that shit? You didn't ask me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Baby, what you need to know, bro? <laughs> That's funny. You know what's crazy? One time um, I was in the studio with Akon and Boo said something. You know, but Boo's Boo. Yeah. Boo ain't Omar with it. Yeah. And they talking one way. So then Akon said something to me. He's like, oh, Boo's like, Akon, you, you're saying in front of Slaw. Like, like, you can't tell him. to." He's like, he started us. What he didn't realize yeah. was the Akon was on a Fuji Live remix. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what I heard, on, yeah. The Akon's on the, full, on the score. So all the Fuji remixes, because I had, you know, business game. Yeah. A-side protection. So when yeah. they put Fuji Live on the score three times, I got paid three times because nobody's points could, you know yeah. what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? So I'll be in his office. Boom. <laughs> so, 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 like I so I got paid three times for that. So Akon's on that record. Yeah. And then when he, when Ian Burke yeah. had signed him to Electra, I'd also have remixed records for Akon. So before Akon was locked up, Akon, SRC Akon, he'd already interacted with me twice without even seeing me. Exactly. So ultimately, he's just like, nah, he's the person that made it possible for us without closing the door and saying it had to be me. And even with the score, they were on it because I made sure Wyclef and Lauren knew what to do production-wise. And I did it with an open hand, giving them the shot. I recorded Fujila with no budget. They ain't had no budget. And you was their age, though, bro. That's the part. Like you, that's the part that made you ill. It wasn't like you was like. It was almost like your father handed you all the wisdom, and you walked into the room as a 19, 20, 20 year kid. And where you are, where most people at that age are trying to figure out, you kind of knew. I mean, I I knew when I was taking it on, and I also understood that if you're doing stuff with the right intention, like that's that's ultimately where. The biggest thing for me at this point in life, just when I was able to really look back and when I said, hey, I retired and I'm stepping out of the room, it was really like, what am I really giving to people? Am I giving you kicks and snares or am I giving you the opportunity to really build and do what you want to do? And, you know, once again, me and Akon got a whole album in the can. We got all types of records happening. But the biggest thing was I acted 
in a way that gave Clef and them a space mm. to put the book of basement in Jersey because they saw how I had my studio. Hey, we're going to do it. I told them, nah, you can produce it yourself. Just mm -hmm. do this, this, and this. Stood behind them, added things without actually trying to take over that opened the door for there to be an Akon. Mm -hmm. And how many people now benefit from Akon? Yeah. So that's really, that's the, put, that's the pay it forward. Me? You right. Know what I'm yeah, like, exactly. I question, and this is for the younger A&Rs. How right. did you develop the trust of those of, during the Lauryn Hill and Fuji days? Like, how did you develop the trust of the artists in order to get, to build those projects? Um, it's two levels today. One is... The material, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to push play. Like, I could not like you, but if I hear something that's right, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. He ain't that bad. Yo, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. that's number one. So, one first things first is material. And then the second part of it is, um, like, when it first came down to Fuji. So, how I got to the Fuji's, for instance, was I was doing all the records for the West Indian artists. I was remixing the Super Cat, this, that, and the third. And there was Mega Bands and Soundboy Killing. Flex is playing that. Big up Jeff Burroughs. Jeff Burroughs and Jessica Rosenblum. I don't know if they were roommates or something. They were tight at the time. He's like, yo, I have this group called the Fugees. They're Haitian. I need them to get on the radio bumping like how that Mega Banton sound. Mm. Who did it? So she calls like, who did the record? Salam did it. Boom. So Jeff, being the product manager, called me mm. to actually say, yo, could you um, maybe come to my office and meet? So I'm like, all right. You know, at that time, I'm doing... All the records, you know, big up Vivian Scott Chu. I'm in Shaba Patra, Vicious, mm. Mag Cobra, <laughs> Super Cat, everybody. I was already in the yeah, building. Yeah, and <laughs> basically, so yeah, pretty much, I mean, for the most part, everybody that was dance hall coming to America, I was flipping the mixes and knew what to do. Me and Bobby Connors were doing something first, and then I did a lot on my own. How did you know what to do with the reggae? West Indian. Indian. So yeah, my father's. Okay. Um, Trinidad, Laventil, Arima, and he came, and I understood that. But also, yeah. it's bigger than that. Being a New Yorker, West yeah. Indian culture is part of New York culture. Yes, Jamaican culture and Latin culture is part of New York culture. So if you live in New York, you most likely have eaten Jamaican food, and you most likely have eaten some Latin food, and, and it was all one thing. You them, for sure. Like yeah. everywhere you go, like I remember yeah. being like in New York. I remember being a kid, and the cab drivers was all African. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you just you encountered Africans or Jamaicans, you encountered them no matter what because we it wasn't exactly. over. You had to everybody you either caught exactly. the bus or a cab. Exactly. So that was putting those pieces together. Well, back to the story about like you no know, knowing what to do with the Fuji's. So then now when the Fuji's come by to meet me, I'm like, all right, so cool. Jeff Burroughs calls me. I'm already in Sony. I'm walking around like, ah, what floor are you on? I just walk into his office. You no, know, once again, Pop showed me how to navigate. We had living in, I'm living on 53rd Street. Sony's on 55th Street. I go up in the building. So which I got. He shows me the thing. I'm like, who's the manager? David Sonnenberg. Oh, all right, cool. David Sonnenberg had actually called me to do a group one time called Natural Selection. They were renting our studio. They wanted me to do something. I told them I didn't want the money. Like, I don't need it. And the record's cool. David Sonnenberg was so impressed that I was 18 and told him to keep his bread. David, Sonnen did, David Sonnenberg, uh, uh, never mind. That's not the movie producer. He produced When We Are Kings, uh, okay. the Ali movie. Okay, but cool. he's done stuff like that. Got you. But he's a huge manager that did, you know, Meatloaf, Springsteen, oh, wow. Spin Doctors, and he had Fuji's. And at that time, Bernard Alexander was also working there. Bernard. So Bernard was working for David, and they had Nas, Akinelli, Biz Markie, Jungle Brothers, Fuji's. So that was what's happening. So that's how Bernard is so. Con I'm sorry. So I that, that that was part of. It. I mean, Bernard yeah. is doing the different. But at that, this is like ninety one, two, three. Yeah. Bernard is working in David's office as that manager, and Phil Pabon was around as well. So I was like, "All right, who's the manager? Cool, David. All right, cool. I got that. What you want to get done? Okay, you need this to go to radio. This is what it is. All right, cool. Send him to meet me. So Bernard, because his EPMD background was like Eric Sermon would do it for twelve. I'll do it for 10, and then me knowing you know, the game. Long way around to your story, which you asked me, <laughs> but, but, but I'm, just, I'm just telling you how to, as I'm remembering it. So being in the business, I'm 20, but I also understand that after Thanksgiving, I'm not getting another check till after the Grammys. Mm -hmm. You ain't getting no two sign a check out of nobody. So Thanksgiving's coming. I'm like, all right, so what's up? Eric Sermon went 12? All right, I'll do it for, he went, Eric Sermon was 15? All right, I'll do it for 12. Cool. 
Why? Because I get that six grand. That's the Christmas money right there. Exactly. Boom. <laughs> so they send them through. We do our session like December 13th. I'm like, yo, just send them by because I'm doing a remix, but it's a brand new record yeah. called Nappy Heads. Yeah. So Clef comes by. He got the bubble goose on. He got his hair nappy. I'm like, all right. So I'm hearing what they're doing. You know, they're rhyming, grimy. You know, they're doing what was popping in 91 into 92. And I put together the basic track, you know, the bells, whatever it is. I'm blending It Ain't Hard to Tell, and I'm blending um, J. Roo's Come Clean over the top of that basic yeah. track. In my crib, I lived on right next to Def Jam, where Def Jam was on 50th between 9th and 10th. Clef is like, yo, I got to introduce you to the girl in the group and Praz. Cool. He comes back with them. Before we go to the studio, I'm playing it for them. I was like, all right, cool. I like the vibe. Okay, Clef is like, this is the zone you want me to go in? He starts writing rhymes, like it ain't hard to tell, and like yeah. that. Now going from his grimy, you know, booth bar and that whole thing, he's going into the zone that I'm showing him. And then Prize walks in, and Prize is like, yo, my man Kobe that went to Rutgers with me always used to talk about you. He'd come back to school because he was interning, Kobe Brown at Sony, who's been there forever, taking care of all the sample aspects. When he was an intern at Tommy Boy, mm -hmm. used to hang out yeah. at my sessions. Mm. So once again, I already came into the space where not only did I have something that was there, but all the players already knew of me in a positive light from before that. So prize, cleft, this and that. So then the trust was like, okay, well, we trust him. It seems like he knows what to do. He's already been referred from different situations that nobody knew about now we need to get in and do this clef rhymes for 13 minutes i pluck out this is what it is keep this part you know and this is like prior to pro tools so the tape ran off yeah. twice <laughs> no but i was like you know what i'm saying like he rhymed for six minutes and another like seven minutes or whatever it was and when he did that i was like yo that mona lisa and then you know that um i fly away i'm just telling them different bars i want to take this these are the parts i really like let's make it into one thing when he lays down that verse, Lauren does her parts. We kind of go through it. Prize does his pieces. And then what I made out of that record ended up becoming something. So I watched Clef on another platform where he was saying, you know, we went to Europe because they were getting shows. They had the right management. They're mm -hmm. out there performing and doing. We got the vocab and all that stuff. But when they actually got back and that record was out, they went to Jones Beach and performed. And then the crowd was singing the record back to him. He's like, wait a minute, I've been performing at the crowd all this time. Now they're giving me back energy. And what that became was him going, I got to understand what, what he told did. me to do. <laughs> yeah. Because obviously, you know, in that first session, he's saying, born in a Brooklyn town. You know, he had gone to November. He had so much stuff. But you're so over-talented, you also got to learn how to rock this block. If you don't understand mm -hmm. this block, then you're not going to be able to build this house. You know, I mm. tell a lot of youngers at this point, like, how do you get a bowl of rice? One grain of rice at a time. So you got to yeah. constantly wow. build mm. it. You know what I'm saying? Everybody wants to go and be like the biggest. Yo, we most pop. Nah, you got to learn how to rock this room. Yeah. This room feel good? All right, cool. Now we can take it to this house. Then we yeah. can take it to this building. But if you ain't building like that, you know, you just going for the hype and then it's up and down. It's going. Oh, Y'all see what I'm saying? Why I like to talk to him? Oh, By the way, I would go to his other juju and he would do that. <laughs> like... But I didn't have a mic in front of him, so I had to remember that shit. Like, hey, you know, you got to remember it this. Is, but it's, it's that thing. Like, yeah. Southern Cool Scenes in the book, Soul Food is person to person. So if you ain't capturing something yeah. from somebody actually doing it, then. So I got a couple questions. Uh, I'm going to go with Did this. I answer your question? You did. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> shit, man, you, did. Like, you basically asked me why they trust no, me. Did, but, but, I, but I just gave you the perspective of nah, what happened no, no. for the trust but to it land. Le it, le it leads into another whole other. Well, I'm about to say, you do the Oracle, bro. And to me, I've been saying this. Forever, I'm like, as a young black man walking in this shit, if I don't get into Epic Records, I don't know you exist. I don't hear you talk. I don't learn the lessons. Mm -hmm. And I've always been the guy, so I'm gonna tell you, I've always been the guy like pushing, like go more, more, more. I, remember, I was like, come on. He was like, Ray, I worked at my pace, but yeah. I, I just can't believe that someone has accomplished as much as you've done and it's just so quiet. Like, oh, man, humble. I just want to go to my house in Miami and just work <laughs> with this small artist right here, and I'm cool with that shit. So there's another um, in building. So I got an answer for that though. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take take Lauren, right? Right. With the creative mind like that, to where, you know, there, there's there's the the conversation that she only had one one album, mm -hmm. one amazing album at that. But to work with a creative like that. How do you mold the, that mind to get in that space to create 
a time when people work like that. So, because it's like it's always hard. Uh, to no, no, I'm, 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 I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you how, how you do this. So, there's a thing where, at this point, you know, my dad and his brothers all in their seventies. They all bosses. You can't tell them what to do, but you can ask them a question that makes them decide what to do in a different direction. You know what I'm saying? There's so many people, you can't tell what to do, yeah. but you can ask them a question. So what you want to do, Dad? Mm. Maybe I should go to the doctor. Okay, cool. When you want to go? I agree. Yeah. And then he gets yeah. to a point. But if you tell him what to do, it's not going to work. Right. You know what I'm saying? And with artists, you know, this is where they get mad. You know, certain artists run for me. They be like, the Jedi is too crazy. Because yes. I'm going to go in here and say, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and then how I'm going to end up doing it, because it makes sense yeah. if, if the logic don't kick in, it don't kick in. Mm-hmm. So with my sis, Miss Hill, basically my approach always was, this is what I think it should be, but this is what it could be. So there was a point when I was calling her Madam Potential. <laughs> so we were in the studio, we were working on, I don't think it was Fuji Lot, maybe it was like vocab remix. It was something in that timing. And... She was like, there's so much testosterone in here. So it's just like, you know, oh, these two guys in this band, yeah. this producer, this engineer, I'm the only girl in there. You know, I'm cock weasel. I'm still cave a chest. Like, yeah. she still has this. She's like, nah, and this is what it's going to be. And I'm like, all right, Madam Potential. And so after I called her Madam Potential like 25 times, <laughs> she gets mad and goes, potentially what, Salon? Potentially what? And I'm like, potentially the greatest of all time if you stick with it. Oh, wow. I just made it up. (laughs) I didn't think about that beforehand. I didn't think about Madam. I just made it up. About three months later, I had her say, Madam Potential, I get busy on instrumentals. It's just how you go about saying it. And and the respect has to be earned. You know what I'm saying? That's the biggest part that I have with the current generation. Respect is earned over a period of time. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, that was 93. Up until now, I might get a text right now asking me a question, but you know you're going to get the pure, honest answer from me. That's the relationship that's been built. I can't buy that relationship. That was earned over time and consistently dealing with people a particular way. And, you know, over the years and different aspects of it, you know, her son Joshua was born when we all had happened to been going to Miami right after 9-11. YG Marley record is popping. Hey, Salam, do you know, can you, do you know about how, and now I'm looking at the son of somebody that I was literally, you know, he was in her belly during um, the Unplugged album. But she was hoarse because she was playing the album for me till five o'clock in the morning and had to be back to recording at 10. She sounded amazing though. And she was hoarse, but she sounded, she, But my point yeah. was she was hoarse because she was playing it for me all night. Like, what do you think? What do you think? I'm like, yeah, I like it. And then had to be back at 10 a.m. And this is what oh. you're getting. You're getting the raw me. Yes. But that child that now has a record that's number one and all over the place mm. was born in that space. So I look at all these things like this is how I got here. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I was that child that was born into the space. Yeah. And now we're at the point where this other generation is there. So all I can do, if you give a kid a million dollars and you don't give them the conversations and you don't give them the right aspects to it, is really there and back to what you were saying earlier Ray about you know what's really big and what's really everybody has the way that they go about being that person some people need a watch and a pinky ring I was watching cats on the plane when I was flying out here like oh look a watch a little pinky ring that's cool oh first class that's cute (laughs) like that's cool but (laughs) if that's what you need in order to feel like you but that's not it all my value all my values inside me you you were born with it well, yeah, I was actually born with it inside, but also it's been cultivated that I understand that all my values inside me because I had everything that I could have. You know mm. what I'm saying? All my peeps was in the streets. They was like, I, I've been around everything you can be around, but I also understand that I could walk into a room with nothing. I could take this podcast equipment and make a record right now mm. if I felt like it. I know how to point these mics and put two stumps and put some clicks and make it work. <laughs> okay, so I got a question. I got a question. Dopest shaker you nah. ever get. This is called No Lotion at My Hotel. Mm. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, where's that? I asked you a question. You worked with, to me, I think, the two of the most unique women, female artists of all time, in Lauren and Amy Winehouse. And you've also been a part of both of their classic albums that we still are searching for the feeling. I'm asking you, as someone who has pretty much had his pick, what was it about those two specific that you saw and also was it other artists that you saw like because you're like the oracle like you are like the, the you're yoda to us so you see shit we don't see it's almost, and it's almost like you got your years mm -hmm. in you but you got your dad years your uncle years you you know what i'm trying to say so no, like i've been outside when you when you find it when you look in that talent like what was it about those two in particular but at the second part is what do you look for that makes you excited to do it because you no one excites you but you <laughs> you have to like you just um, said the sound you just like that's you getting excited like nah i know how to make it that's you know yeah because i'm gonna do. be dying laughing like y'all really bought my unlotion hands <laughs> with it No, let me get a kick or two. It's out of here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could do that, and that yeah. would actually work. Somebody's going to loop that and make yeah. it work. Matter of fact, I'll loop it and make it into something. It don't make a difference. I can we just, we, yeah. we're, I, as a creator, see, middlemen to me get nervous when nothing's happening because they got to find, I need you to do something good, and you do something good so I can hedge in between y'all. Yes. As a creator, I don't need anything. Mm. I just need dirt. And, and as long as I got a sane mind, even my crazy mind might be something. I don't yeah. even know. I ain't even find out. You know what I'm saying? But it don't make a difference. You can just create something. And as a creator, as long as I can find somebody that's interested in what I created, mm -hmm. then it goes. Um, back to your question with those vocalists. So I would have met. So let me show you something. What the Fugees did for me as a whole, and definitely Lauryn Hill as well, was that um, they showed me that the beats that I had gotten really good at making, where I did, you know, six months of I'm doing everything 45 King does. Mm -hmm. Six months I'm doing everything the Bomb Squad does. I'm still a kid of 86, 87, 88. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad is a producer. Hey, you play some more music. Looper Vandross, which is just going to loop everything. But I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm that dude who wants to be in my generation and make records. So... Cool. I'm really, you know, Molly Mall is the dad of producers like me yes. in that generation. He is. As far as the guy who's the producer that shows up with the drum machine, he knocks out the beat. It's not the band. It's not the inch. Molly Mall got the drum machine. He got the right loops. He's chopping it up and he's creating an energy that has yes. to happen. Now, outside of Molly Mall, there's 20 other people. Back to what the Fuji showed me. They showed me that the same beat that I made for Fat Joe, which became Fujila, could have sold whatever Jealous One's Envy sold, which I don't think it was that much, or it could do 30 million as a score, the same exact beat, because what we put on the beat now becomes a whole nother thing. It was about the song and the energy and everything else that happens, not just what the beat is, because I can flip the beat 10 times. And it was a thing when, you know, Teddy Riley used to do remixes for songs, but he'd take the same song and do three different mixes and then keep whatever the best one was. Exactly. So for me, my focus became vocal and lyrical focus and energy focus so that, you know, we could turn around and make it work. So for me, that was the most important aspect of it. And what we got from um, actually, you know, seeing what, the Fuji's Lauren, because it's technically the score is her album. Yes. Before. Really? To me, yeah, because it was still Killing Me Softly was the biggest record on the score. Yes. And then all the choruses on the score, except for No Woman No Cry, is Ready or Not, Here I Come. You know what I'm saying? So it was still, the score is her hip hop album preceding yes. the album that she made, Miseducation, Mis right? Yep. And in between that was The Sweetest Thing, yep. right? which mm -hmm. she wrote and came up with and came up, you know, and Clef and Jerry helped and produced along with her, the original version that I did a remix. And then the miseducation was done. But the biggest thing that she did was she changed how 
hip hop and R&B went together. Before yes. that, it was soul to soul, you know, using biz loops and then Teddy Riley, make it last forever. The hardest tabletop beat you can have with the prettiest melody with Jackie McGee and Keith Sweat. So you got put into that. But then what Lauren decided to do, instead of how hip hop R&B was being made at that time, which was taking a hip hop loop and then putting those same, da, na, 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 that's on Keep On Moving. Yeah. That's on everything. Yeah. On Bad Boy and that's yeah. on everything on Uptown. Yeah. That same string line from there. She said, I'm not just gonna loop things. She still had the Wu Tang and the Cream with yeah. with X Factor. But she said, I'm gonna use Stevie Wonder, Carlos Santana, Donnie Hathaway. So she pulled in something else to tell her eighteen year old heartbreak story. She brought in another element mm. into the mix. You get what I'm saying? Yes. So I that was her sorry. her you, that bro. was that was that was her decision Fuck. to do that. But once again, it's also what she knew. When we were doing Fuji La, she I heard a song, The Game of Love, and to me. I just heard that Jackson Five record last week. Yeah. But I knew it because she sang it over the Fuji La beat, along yeah. with I Never Leave You Dream. Like you just put up a beat and she could sing you lyrics from because that's her encyclopedia. She yeah. knows those things. Yeah. So what she became and what she's becoming and what she continues to put forth is her embodying the frequencies of whatever appealed to her. Yes. Great. So that's where she is. When an Amy Winehouse comes around that is pretty much almost 10 years younger, mm -hmm. when I meet Amy, I moved to Miami. I wasn't really thinking, you know, I was semi-retired. I yeah. just turned 30, lost my mom and different stuff. I was like, everybody leave me alone. When Amy walks in and is actually singing. And you know, I couldn't tell if it was kind of like her trying to do a Billie Holiday-ish type thing. She started playing the guitar and singing uh, Girl from Ipanema. Mm. Hmm, this is different. I hadn't had someone who could play this bossa nova and sing out loud and had a real strong voice like that. So it gave me the opportunity to tap into where, what year you leaving New York? 91. All right, cool. So there's a thing where Frankie Crocker would end his radio show. Yep, I remember that. And what song would come on? No, I just remember, I just remember Frankie Crocker. But it was a song that he would play, there I go, there I go, there I go, mm. there I go. Mm. So I now knew this record because that's how we knew it was getting dark and our mother's about to start looking mm. for us right at the time. <laughs> Frankie <on>. Crocker's <laughs> about to come. So I introduced this record to 18-year-old Amy on her first album. Yeah. And she spit it back out like she mm. was 58 years old, like she knew it. So it allowed me to use another part of my brain as far as making a very jazz, very hip-hop album yep. and pull different things together. But also... It allowed me to um, find parts of my musicality that I had never used before. Yeah, because I was so, saying she, it was almost like a challenge. Like, I got to show Definitely. Yeah. So, so I was semi-retired. I didn't want to do it. Leave me alone. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, you can actually sing? So now I can learn how to play this upright bass. I can learn how to do other things that I didn't. So it was. Because it's, it's almost a tool that you add into your arsenal. So now I'm enjoying the with. process. You know, it's yeah. just like with everything else. If you if people that like to work out, you have to start enjoying the process. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to you know be mad. Sometimes it still works. Yeah, sure. But that's what it was. So I started enjoying the process. So I saw in her at 18 and said, ooh, what are you going to be by 25 if this mm. is what you are by 18? So that process of me helping to develop her mm. kind of went there. Other people that was the same way. Right before Amy, it was Miss Dynamite in London. Mm -hmm. Met her. She was 18. We did an album that was huge out there. Miss Dynamite T did 10 songs on that. That was that. Jasmine Sullivan, I worked with when she was really young. Yep. And then by the time our first session, there was a song I had on Nas. There's a war going on tonight. Big up Keon Bryce, who sang that. Peter Edge wanted Jasmine to sing that. And she also wanted Harold Lilly at the time to come right. And I was like, you know what? I worked with her before. Just let her come by herself. Because what yeah. I do is I get with singer-songwriters and I make them the writer. Yes. Mm -hmm. I write with them, but I really help them hone Lead, their yeah. thing. Kind of what you said about your dad. You kind of what would you want to say? How would you say it? Like, you bring right. it so out. So, and then yeah. whatever their ideas are, I kind of do that. So then in that first set of Amy sessions becomes the songs that really stood out. I know I heard Love is Blind, Cherry, all that other stuff. In the first Jasmine Sullivan sessions, we covered the song that Peter wanted, yeah. but we also did Lions, Tigers, and Bears. Mm. It's one of my favorite yeah. records. And Live a Lie. 
But with that, then they would say, wait a minute, Jasmine's probably a better writer than somebody that we can hire. So then now Jasmine's pen is unmatched. Her vocal is really strong, but also her lyrical voice yes. is developed. Yes. So for me, I believed in her song. So I went and you know spent 60 grand on orchestras in Prague and then put that back into Lion Tigers and Bears, Bunch of Windows and a bunch of other records. Yeah. That was my investment out of my pocket because I saw what she could be yeah. and what she still is. Nobody messes with jazz. Jazz yeah. is in a class by herself. Period. She's respected by the Kimberells and the Shockers and everybody that came before her. But everybody after her still plucking things out of pages of what she's done from 2007 to now. She been out Shout out to Jasmine. Shout out to Jasmine. We got a Grammy. That's when we started. Uh, really? Oh, yes. Wait, did you, you yeah. said uh, Orchestra in Prague? Yeah. So you like went over there and. Yeah. Man, I just done Rush Hour 3 with Lalo Schifrin. That's a little flight when I when, when I did that, um, Lalo, we were actually worked on two movies. We worked on After the Sunset, and then we did Rush Hour Three. And when I did Rush Hour Three, we ended up with um, Less Than an Hour. That was Nas and CeeLo, yep. where I was doing all the rhythm section, and Lalo was doing yeah the other stuff. And I was thirty five, and Lalo was seventy five. So for me, I looked at it and said, Hey, you know what? If that's the case, I can be doing this with the chopstick. For yeah. the next forty years, you know what I'm saying? I, I could be sitting <laughs> here, like, Nicks. <laughs> I could sit here, just wave my hand with it, and then end up being something else. So that was exciting for me. And then I was like, well, I need to learn how to work the orchestra because I know how to work the whole band. And you know, we do horns, we do everything else. I can get the rhythm section. I can make a Motown. Right? I need to get that orchestra stuff down. So they said, if you go to Prague, you actually can buy out the orchestras and do. So I was like, all right. I took some money to Prague, and then I recorded an album I called Prognosis, but that became Nas's Queen Story and the Black Bond. Mm. It became records I did with Neo, Lions and Tigers, uh, Lions, Tigers and Bears, Bush of Windows, a lot of other records that, you know, Cat Dahlia's Lava, all that stuff happened out of my Prague sessions, and then I just kept doing that all the way. So you would, just have a, you would just have an orchestra play music with you, and then you would take, you compose it all. Pieces off it. Yeah. What I did was I took tracks that I had ideas that people yeah. didn't use, like leftover non I just had a bunch of music, and then I went to each one, and then kind of hummed out what I wanted. And then I got with three different arrangers, and then learned their different styles. And I got with three different orchestrators. So I just oh, wow. kind of went to different things. And then I recorded at three different studios. I recorded the Rodolphinum, their concert hall, and a TV studio, and something in the middle. So then that way I would know which buttons I wanted to push depending on what the record was. Mm-hmm. So and I covered all that stuff. And then I did, you know, another album, one in the chamber, like all the other stuff was me basing it off of that. But back, and I don't want to lose my first one. Go ahead. So Amy Lauren. Well, Lauren into Amy, Jasmine. I also heard some of that stuff in Snow early. Yeah. Which no ID was delivering Snow. Snow is signed to Epic, so I ended up signing Snow. But Snow, to this day, has so much potential. You know, Dion said she's about to drop a news. But she has a voice that yes. actually sits a certain way. It's just her lyrical voice developed over her time when yes. she decided what she wanted to do. Coco Jones. Mm. Coco's amazing. Mm. <laughs> we just did a Coco, record, Coco got something. You know, I'm yeah. retired, but my crew, Osmosis Architects, did some records with her. For real. That I kind of like, all right, cool. But Coco, she got a mouth on her that if she puts it raw into the lyrics, it's there, but she also can sing all types of stuff. Yes. Yeah. In different places. I saw something. Big up Mike Jackson. He told me about it. Then I saw her do a freestyle on Sway. And I was like, oh, look, she got the little thing there. That can work. Yeah. And then, you know, got her in a room and put some things into it. And some records will come from it, but, you know, so I have a Coco, Coco, Coco got that. Because, so your pops, your pops, your uncle, everybody was in the business. Your transition as, as a creative going into the business and now assuming an executive role, how are you able to now hone in all of that and actually, like, create your space to where... The people on the admin side understood what you were doing. The people on, on the product side understood what you were doing. They were like, yo, let Salam cook. Whatever Salam wants to do, let him cook because he's, like, he's masterminding. So what happened was my father being a creative and then going to the business side, then when I became the core creative in the team, he was doing the business. He was doing it, but I still understood it. Similar to, like even me and Jermaine have something in common, which is he's Jermaine Dupree Malden. His pops, Michael Malden, I've talked to a lot more than I've ever spoken to Jermaine. But <laughs> that's crazy. His pops, business-wise, was doing stuff. My father, Van Gibbs, I'm Salam Ramey Gibbs. 
the same way mm. because they became the execs, but they still had something when, you know, we were young and doing things and developing pieces. So I understood what was happening business wise. Mm. I was never just like somebody could be like, just like Ray could say, somebody be like, oh, Salam's going to do this. I'm like, did you talk to him? Because you can't talk me into a box. So it's just <laughs> the same situation. I understood what it was, but if somebody's an exec or an accountant or whatever it is, they have a conversation with me, then they're going to be clear. I understand their job. Mm. And then that's how you earn anything. If you talk to a musician and you can say, you know, I had a meeting with Lawrence Fishburne. We were working on a play. Um, and he's like, yeah, these plays in New York. I'm like, don't bother me. I can't cope. Young, know, too short the box forgot. And he was like, okay, all right, see, I ain't even got to tell you because there's certain stuff that I understand that he understands. Yeah. He That's told hard. me where he was from. He told me where it was at. He told me his brother. Oh, I'm like, oh, you over there? All right, cool. So now I already know who's sitting next to me yeah. without even knowing who's sitting next exactly. to me. Exactly. Because that's part of what it is. So when you say certain things to people, there's certain things that you're not going to know unless you lived it. And that's where I'm able to speak to an executive and I understand what they're dealing with. You know, so I talk to mm. people all the time. So when Ray's an executive and he's like, I'm trying to get this done, I'm like, oh, Ray, you the bull in the china shop. You trying to get this done? Mm. Let them get what they want. And then you get what you want. Yeah. But if you're trying to make it all you, it's never going to work. Yeah. Mm. All those conversations. But it's funny because as I'm sitting here, listen to you talk, I feel like I understand you more. You never chased an artist. You only was committed to your own version of greatness. And it just so happened that you were prepared. And the way God works, it was things lined up because you were prepared. But... And I tell us, I tell us people all the time, I'm like, the biggest problem that we have is that we're praying for opportunities and not preparing for them. Because you'll get the opportunity. Like, an opportunity knocks every day. But mm -hmm. most of the time, we ain't ready. Mm -hmm. And ready don't mean, like, physically ready. Ready means mentally ready. Like, yeah. do you even understand the opportunity that you have? Do you understand? Like, I'm I just random, random. But when someone asked me to be in the music business, I was 22 years old. And I remember thinking, like, I'm going to do this shit right so right that anybody before me or after me is like, he did it. That was my only goal. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, money was second, but it was my, my only goal was to just like do it right. And as I'm listening to you talking, I'm like, damn, this, it wasn't like, it was kind of like you were just honing yourself and you were like, oh shit, here's a new opportunity to challenge myself. Here's a new opportunity. It was like, you saw opportunity. You, but that thing you said about 30 million album record versus three, a, a 2 million album record, that shit can't go unnoticed, bro. I mean, and the same beat? Like, that's, I never even looked, because, you know, I manage writers, so I'm always thinking about the song. But you're like, that beat on him is going to make me 100,000, but that beat on them is going to make me five minutes. It's like, shit, the mm. difference. Yeah. I never looked at it like that, like, honestly. So it's like, I'm amazed at how you honored your process and you won every time. And, you, and I, now I understand why I don't give a fuck. Because it was like, I wasn't trying to go big. I was just trying to make sure Salam was the best. Mm -hmm. So when I walked in the room, if somebody said, Salam, do you understand about country rap? You're like, I was watching a documentary on something about this. I think I got an idea. That's where it comes from. It come, you really are the, 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 the vessel. I never well, realized that. You know, more than anything else, my um, grandmother, big up Mother Wiggins, passed away at uh, 99 and a half. And she was the mother of the church. She was the great, the daycare center for a lot of Northside Queens where I was at. She was that person. And one thing I always remind people is I'd be like, Grandma, this, that, and the third. And she'd be like, is that so? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> is that so wasn't you're wrong or you're right? She's going to give you her opinion after. But is that so was still, I'm listening to you and I'm allowing you to potentially teach me something. Yeah. Is that so was like, oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, sound like he made it up to me, but, <laughs> but it's just the whole idea of that. So to me, if you're walking into a space and I'm walking in here saying, I know what's going to happen, then I already cut off some of the possibilities. That's crazy. If I walk into a space and I'd be like, hey, okay, cool. Now I'm wondering what records did you produce? I probably sampled one of them. I probably knew something. There's another space to that. Okay, worry. His brother is there. Gilmore's, right? 192nd. I wonder if he's on the same side as No Names. I'm already databasing mm. 20 different things of information. Cape Verdean? All right, cool. That's them Boston people yeah. over there. They're in the Bay, too. All right, cool. My man, that? look. This and that. So I'm already, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm already putting all the pieces together and figuring out everything that's happening and computing it so that when somebody says something, 
Yes, I am prepared for it. And see, this is what the difference is. A lot of people keep saying, I got to make money. The problem is if you make money and you didn't have any idea what you were going to do with money and where to go with it, you already killed yourself. If I give somebody a million dollars and I don't have a conversation with them, I robbed them. Mm. Mm. That's boss. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. You robbed them for the million because you 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 know what they're going to do. Because they already in a position and they didn't really understand it. So what I'm doing by example, because sometimes you can write a book. Once again, that's Southern Cuisine is in the book. The soul food is I'm going, I do it. What I'm doing and passing on to the people that I've interacted with, artistically, musicians you know about, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of executives, there's a lot of people, that actors, not even people that do physical art, and even just conversations, people in the streets, whatever it may be. I'm kind of giving them some perspective on where they are mm-hmm. and what's happening around them so that now they can better prepare it. Because if you don't understand who you are, in the overall situation and what your intention is, then you just walking in it trying to get all the biggest. All yeah. the biggest ain't the best. Yeah. Mm. All the biggest ain't the realest. It's not the most authentic. It's not what's going to last for you. The biggest and the best thing that you can do is for an artist or even someone who works in different spaces is to be able to get paid for being who you are. Sure. See then you never got to get dressed for work because you already Facts. was at work. Facts. You know what I'm saying? Right now. So, so then, so you're never actually yeah. doing it. No so when, when you actually in it and you already understand who you are, I understand and I can sit down and talk to people. So yeah. this is cool. But then I can sell this talk in this form, which people, that's cool. Or I could actually be out here doing work where I'm now planting a whole forest. So by the time you look it up, then how does forest get here? Somebody yeah. planted a lot of trees. Exactly. So what do you think we are in the state of the business right now? Like, do you think, we are on an upward trajectory or is it like a have we reached a point where it's like there has to be a a new something a new kind of a reset well it depends there's two sides of it one side is there are a lot of people who feel like the independent route has been you know where i can get more money up front this that, and the third that's cool if it's money but once again are you getting paid for doing what everybody else did or are you getting paid for being yourself? Right. So if the trend changes, do I have to change the trend in order to for now be in a space to get paid or am I just, oh, y'all came all the way back around. Like what I've been around long enough is I'm like, oh, they're going that way. Cool. Eventually they're going to need all these frequencies. I got a thousand of them. Mm-hmm. So I just wait my turn. I just don't go outside and try to be on everybody's trend. Oh, Katy Perry session. Oh, get over here. This and that. Like I did sessions with every writer and I did it all. It doesn't make a difference. What really makes a difference is when that gold, every record that somebody could say, hey, I love that record Salam did, it was me and an artist sitting in a room cooking a frequency that nobody heard already. Mm. So if that's the case, then the business is just going to get to a point where they're going to get bored with all the sounds and all the energy that you got already, and then they're going to want something new. And then when that is something new, if it's positioned properly, it will take over everything. Mm. That's what that side of it is. Now, the other side is for people who just want to be in the label and they want to get the job. and they want to be, That big company thing is going to keep dwindling down. There'll be less and less seats inside of it because of the fact that they still have to figure out who they're going to spend this money on. You know, is it the streams or that? Okay, Spotify shifted to this. Apple Music's not doing that. Everybody's going to keep trying to figure it out. But once again, you're still asking a middleman for a job when the middleman is still middlemanning, so what's he gonna do? Mm. He's gonna keep hedging you out, even if you're the creator. No matter what. That's, yeah. that's how he keep, cause he knows it's dwindling, and he's like, you can't come in here with that exciting energy. They gonna think they don't need me no more. Stay they right try, there. Cause their job is to get it from you. And yeah. then, you know, what I had to remind Ray is that, yo, you see what they did to the talent? Oh man, they got him to re-sign without even giving them all his bread. Yeah. Well, you're executive talent. Yeah. So you ain't no different. That's <laughs> real. They trying to get you to resign. What so if somebody asks me like, "Oh, what you gonna do?" About that. I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> how long is your contract? How long you gonna be here?" You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so I have a. I have so a, did I answer your question? That, that, that definitely, <laughs> did. It definitely did. So my thing to you is, is what do you, if you took over, let's say Salam, and I know it's not gonna happen because you gonna say no. But let's say Salam just became the CEO of RCA Records. Or I'm going to say Def Jam because they're a, a, a label on the rise. What are you doing? Loaded question. 
I know because I'm only asking <laughs> that because I'm asking that because you're one of those rare people. It's hard, by the way, and I think what you we all can appreciate about you, and I try my best to be that is most people just see their 90 degrees. This is what I see. You know, you got some good people that see 180, but those goats they see 360 mm -hmm. 360 perspective, mm -hmm. and you see 360 perspective where you're literally saying, "Here's what the artist is going through, and that's why I'm gonna do this. Here's what this person is going through." So I'm asking you, it is loaded on a bigger level, but I'm asking you. I'm gonna make it easier. What are the, cause um, Bob Iger in his book says, when you're taking over a company, you should never have more than five points. Like when you're trying to be the president, you should never have more than five points. Like what would be the five things you would do? First, I'm gonna take it off of Dash Jam. Okay, perfect. Um, I won't do that to Tanji. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, cause I'll tell Tanji whatever it is I thought. And I told him that when he was first starting, I told Tanji and Latrice what I thought was going on, but whatever it is, that's there. So I don't even want to say Def Jam because once again, you know, the world's changing. Mm -hmm. um, what I would look at if you were going into a situation, you know, just from my own experience, I got a chance and the reason why I was so excited about being on that 32nd floor where you saw me is that prior to that, Solution Grange had asked me to come to Universal and he had told me you no, know, stick close to Barry Weiss who just got in there. And then I was yep. having a conversation with uh, the Lippman brothers about different things. But when I got the chance to report to Doug, I realized that all the people I was speaking to had come up and had some tutelage from Doug. And I felt like Doug Morris was only going to have a certain amount of more years being in that head position. So why not go to Doug Morris University for four years? Yes. Where I can now get some of the information that he might have given to these people that I would now be reporting to who would give it me their version of it, but then now I can hear it from source. Mm. So part of that 360 view, because I knew my career as a creator and how to manipulate how I can get this check before Thanksgiving, I can get that one as that or that at Sony. Now they gonna hold that check to the first. That's their fiscal. Like I yeah. know where the yeah. numbers are. <laughs> you know, big up Tango, he always be laughing at me. You always talking about the money in quarters. Cause they talking about the money in quarters. I gotta yeah. know how I'm fitting into their budget exactly. or else I'm just one, <laughs> wasting my time. Yeah. So in saying that, by reporting to Doug, um, Doug and then also Mel Lewinter would you know, give me little jewels and also, Julie Swidler, um, you know, being the legal space. And then on that floor was L.A. Reid, Rob Stringer, um, Kevin Kelleher, you know, just the, the whole executive team. And then also Peter Edge, who, you know, I did Bush Babies with Peter Edge back in 92, 3. Um, when it comes down to it, number one, you got to have something that you can get started. So what ends up happening is, I signed a lot of music that I really felt was great, yeah. but that doesn't mean the timing is right. Wow. Yes. That doesn't mean that radio picked it up at that time. There might've been too many of the same type of records, another song with the same title. It doesn't mean they had the right manager. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the, um, might not, this might not have been the record. Yep. Um, the biggest thing you have to do is you got to be able to press play on having something that gets the room excited. And the room excited doesn't necessarily mean the people on the outside. Yep. Your team has to be able to feel like this is it. If you are my squad, I got to be able to say something or play something that now gets you guys excited. Mm -hmm. And then the way that you explain it to everybody now, you don't understand. Mm. Yeah. Nah, this is, you don't understand. Dude, what we got right now, it's playing right now. Look, this is how we moving. Oh, this is how you hold the champagne glass and dance. <laughs> you understand? It was taught. This, this is the aspect. So the first thing you got to have is you got to have people that speak the language, that understand where you are, so that now they can now go out and do it. From your marketing to your promotion team to your, you know, A&R, everybody. Your, your, the A&Rs, and then also just the lifestyle aspect of it. If y'all see what it is, because we got to have some wins that aren't obvious wins. If you sign the record that everybody's talking about on TikTok, or if you sign the record that just happened last week because somebody just did something just like it, 
you cool, but you always chasing. Mm-hmm. Yep. To be able to get that going, you need to have that thing. So then it gets back to something that Ellie Reed told me. Oh, I was there and I needed to have it, but I had to have my producers around me who could deliver different things. Mm. So his LaFace era, when he wasn't always in the studio, yes, Kenny was doing certain singles. And yeah, doing but he was things, running the company. But Dallas, Jermaine, Jermaine. Organized Noise yep. were core creation hubs yep. that could now come up with things and actually make it work. So it's the same thing. If I look at somebody and they're doing a label, who's your squad that you know you can throw ideas to that can come up with something that's fresh and new on a weekly basis, mm. that you got something to play in the A&R room that's like, yo, what's this? You've been in them rooms where, you know, in a couple companies, right? What you got to play this week, right? You better have something. And if you got something to play, then when it plays and everybody goes, whoa, okay, now the urgency's on. Okay, look, we were going to do a lot of different things this quarter, but we putting all our horses on this. Yeah. yeah. This is what we got to deliver by April 1st. This is what yeah. we got to deliver by July 1st. This is our priority. Yeah. If you don't get it at radio, that's your ass. If you don't get me the right looks I need at Tay TV, that's you. If you don't make sure that we brand the line and if mm. you don't talk to streaming, then what are we doing this for? Mm. Don't y'all all agree we got that move? By the way, that's our Absolutely. advantage. That's, that, that's, that's what we got to turn around and move. So... Anybody running a company, you got to have that in multiple spaces. Now, the problem you have when you're running a major label, because, you know, Doug told me what it would take to run a label, is that you got to have two to three killers per quarter. But if you already are coming into a space where you're inheriting 60% of a staff that you can't move that might not be inspired. That's on the contract that might not know you. That's not actually moving in a certain space. And you're also inheriting... 80% 80% of a roster that might not respond to your visions or your ideas. Now you're at a disadvantage because you now got to get, it's like saying it's like you got to get everybody to move their car to the other side of the street Yep. Mm. So, so that you can get up the block. Mm. How many people go, yeah, y'all going to move the other side? What day? Yep. Oh, man. Yeah. Like, so what I told... What I told, and this might sound kind of crazy, but I'm going to say it anyway. So I was talking to my team last over the last couple of days, and I was like, sometimes the issue is, all right, Ray, I'm going to hit you with this. So Go ahead. Come to the Chinese restaurant. Okay. I'm the Chinese restaurant. I need you to order some food. Which, what's your order? My, you want me to tell you? Yeah, my, wings, order is, uh, no, my order is uh, braised wings and chicken fried rice and onions. Braised wings? Uh, Man, you want, you fuck alone, man. Braised wings are bomb. You want, you want some spicy? Braised wings are spicy as I'm going to get. All right, so it's the braised wings spicy. Anything else to drink? Yeah, I want a uh, bottle of water. <laughs> so, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I heard what you said. So I got to talk nice to you. Why? Because you're, you're the customer. The customer. But they got to get busy. Yeah. They- I don't know what he just said. But they got to understand and they got to get the moving. They got to hear my voice. Why? Because we got a long line here and you need your braids wings. You on lunch break. Yep. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So all I to say, I could be real cool and I'm like, yo, what's up? We in the war. We got to get this going. But when it's go time, I got to be able to. (laughs) You got to be able to say. Yeah. Right. So that Chinese food thing was the only way that I could describe to my team I'm using that, that I'm talking forward. really yeah. nice to y'all right now. It's cool. What y'all want for light? lunch? All right, cool. You want an extra soda? Oh, why don't you get a milkshake? Get the dessert. Yep. Oh, get an extra two beef patties. You can eat them at home. Yep. Cool. We can do all of that. But when I say go, it's go time because yeah. otherwise there's no product. Yes. Without no product, you have no customer. You have no money. What do you think that's come, that comes from just the, this new generation of, of people coming in? They don't have the same work ethic. They don't have, like, they're not trying to earn it. They're just trying to. It's all good. And some people look like they got money and don't. Mm-hmm. Now, and I was about to say, like, you got to understand, like, from, from, the, from his perspective, like, I'm going to work. I'm not waiting for you to work. I'm leading by example. The problem is, is that you have, he grew up in it understanding his role me being like when i was when i met salam originally i didn't understand my role i was trying to figure it out and i was also flying a plane at the same time but i think one of the biggest problems though you think about it you think about take take label internships right why are you going to colleges and saying hey let me get some kids that are that want to do a summer internship Uh, there's a reason for it no mind you i think i think that 
yeah. there's there's it should be half and half, right? Because what I realized, like in building our team, I took a lot of dogs that would probably wouldn't have got hired anywhere else, but they are savages, mm. yeah. and they have a different work ethic and different drive in them. It's bigger than that. How many siblings you got? Two. How many of them can you live with? Neither. All right, cool. <laughs> oh, I mean, I I, I'm not here. You could, yeah, you not so you <laughs> double them back. <laughs> no, All right, no, cool, 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 cool. And then when you live together, how's the hierarchy go? Whose idea needs to get to happen? Me, I'm the oldest. But so, so my point is, you're taking that role and you're saying you could live with them, but your siblings are gonna do what they wanna do. Facts. Understanding that. So it still comes back down to the leadership and it's there, but you know if, yo, you know what? I need to get this 500,000 to Texas by Tuesday. Which one of your siblings you gonna call? Or are you gonna do it yourself? So my point is, nah, I call my little sister. I call. Her. So so you know who's going to deliver and who's not going to deliver. Right. So there's nothing wrong with your siblings. It's just you know who's going to do something. So when I get a batch of interns or a team or whatever it may be, I just got to know who's going to deliver what and what they might be. It's not that they're because they'll look at each other and be like, ah, oh, what are we here all together for? It's all good. The plan is I have to know who's going to deliver what in order to make it work because everybody has a talent. They just have to figure out what their talent is and then they have to be put in a position to utilize it. But, I, but I, that, well, I'm referring to I shouldn't have to motivate leadership. you. I shouldn't have to motivate you to want to No, 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 no. No, no. And that's, but, but, but you, have, you, you have to understand who's good for what. Somebody not being motivated is one thing. Somebody understanding what they're great at is something else. Because I might see something in you before you see it in yourself. Yeah. Mm. And that's what I was about to say. I was about to say, like, I think it's leadership. Like, I never believed I, I was supposed to be in the music business until I met L.A. Reid. Because I never saw it done right. I've, I've been around it. I might have came in the room and got a check. But I'm talking about, like, watching the banker run the bank. Yeah. And like when you start understanding, it was like, um, what's my man's name? David Geffen has a famous quote. He said when he, he moved to California and he said he was an agent at William Morris. And he said that every agent was bullshit. And he's like, oh, because, you know, you're thinking, like, how can I be an agent? And then you're like, oh, they're just bullshitting. And then he said, I can bullshit. And that's and he became David fucking Geffen. But the point is, is that in our world, everybody's not going to be the alpha personality. So sometimes you need somebody around to say, hey, man, I know, you, I know you like that, but you would be a great... It's like, I use Jack Dan's. Jack Dan's was running around as a manager, but the one thing that I like that he did, he liked to talk. Right. I don't want to talk. <laughs> so when we go out, I don't want to go out with Jack because all Jack... Not, Salam, Jack wants to get your number. He <laughs> wants to connect you. He can't wait to text you. It's Jack Dan's, lock me in. I'm like, I don't want to do that. He didn't, he's shining in his role now. He didn't know that that was a, that's not what he came in for. He actually bought someone else to help do that role. And they was kind of like, they were a little jaded, if you will. They were in a different state where they was like, I know how this goes. I know I need to be for it to win. And I'm like, well, shit, I know too. I think that's why you're here. But can, I, I don't know. Like, I just went to KG and I was like, yo, KG. Did I say that? I was like, yo, if I fuck up, tell me I fucked up. Make me better. Like, I want to be better at this job. I just did that. That's me. I could lead, but that's me saying lead me because she sees me in a way that I don't see me. Right. So what Salam is saying to me is when you hear people talk about L.A. Reid, Jimmy Iovine, Peter Edge, Clive Davis. L.A. told me one day, he said that. Which, what's his name? Bur Steve Berman used to be, Steve Bartles used to be Clive Davis' note taker. By the time I got in business, Steve Bartles was the CEO of Def Jam. Mm. Mm. So I'm like, so of course I see him differently. But L.A. see him as what he started as. The problem with the business is that the, the, the next generation is that they don't, they think they know and they don't want to hear old heads tell them. Mm. And that's why I don't talk to them and I just let them loose. But Salam could see shit like Salam would see shit in me that I didn't see. He would tell me, Ray, you got to do this. I'm like, I didn't even know that. He's here first. Why wouldn't mm. I listen to him? And to me, that's the problem. The problem is, is that people are coming in and saying, your role is streaming. You're going to do streaming. Now, what if he got a good ear? Mm. Ask Latrice when I used to work at Epic, that was my biggest problem. Latrice had passion for AR. Latrice was really the AR for she was the marketing person, but she was the AR. And I was like, why don't we just Latrice, let her AR? And they was like, we don't, she does marketing. I'm like, okay. So that's the problem. To me, it's like to me, it's like in order, like Salam is all of these things, but if he had one person running his life, he might have been one thing. That one person might have said, You can't do that. You're gonna do this. But because you 
use your imagination, you went into worlds. And I just got to say this, because you said something. Man, we got to really give shout out to people with imaginations. For sure. We don't do that enough. And we, and we make fun of dreamers. Mm. And that's whack. Because this building that we're in was someone's imagination. Yeah. These mics were someone, everything we have on, clothes, right. everything that exists came from a thought. Came from a thought. But it's like we don't like, we don't push, imagine. Uh, right. It's like you're in the real world now. Do real shit. Nah. No. Bro, that's why I'm always happy because I'm really living in my imagination. Mm. And I, I was working at Delta living in somebody else's imagination. I was cool. But when I'm living in mine, you can't, I can't have a bad day. Right. I can't because we can come up with a thought, put that thought out, and that thought changed the world. Leading me to is one thing you always said. I remember being around, you always said, Ray, my stuff comes later. Like, you would always say, like, the world gets me later. I remember when mm. Cheerleader was out, and it was the biggest song in the world. And he was like, they, they, you know, they're just catching on. And when we did our, our records with you, it was like, I know the label wants Luke records because, but our, my record is going to catch. And I was like, it is. And to be honest with you, the only song from the album I remember outside of Locked Away, I, and this is the album I executive produced, is Broadway like the the, the beat the way the beat drives? I, I swear to God, before I knew I was interviewing you for the last month, I just been singing we're broad, broader than Broadway, and then the beat drops. Sam posted it the other day. Yeah, I didn't, uh, something happened because I'm like, bro, like Broadway was a, and in today's world, it can't come. Checking for you is still asleep. Checking for you is crazy. I might have to cover it with somebody else. You should, but that's what I'm saying. Like I love that. You should though, because checking for you is a smash. Broadway was a smash, but we had some shit. Well, I mean, you know, there's one thing I've said to all the execs, you know, from the Peter Edges to the L.A. Reeds, et cetera. I was like, let me ask you a question. You had a label, huh? Yeah. How many gold and platinum records you have? Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't know. Why? Because mm -hmm. I do this. Yeah. <laughs> That's really I it do is. this. If you can count how many records you sold or how many gold and platinums you have, it ain't enough. Nah. If you really run in a major company, you're supposed to have two golds and two platinums every week. Yep. Mm. And if you've been doing that for 20 some odd years, you cannot count how many times you do that. Now, if you're a dude that makes records and records that stick, how many records do you got that can stick? I don't know. Like, you know, you just said, oh, I figured you out from Amy Winehouse. Like, if somebody says, I know of you, I have to be like, from where? Yes. So many yeah. levels. Like, so what, what point did you start? 91, 92? <laughs> somebody, somebody be like, oh, yeah, because I saw your name with Brent Fires and ASAP Ferg on. Yeah. Dream. Like, oh, you saw that? Oh, that's nice. Oh, you know, Doja, <laughs> Doja Cat rules, right? Yeah. Oh, you, oh you, yeah, I saw your name on Doja Cat's album. And I was like, you did rules with us? So you didn't even know. Wow. We did rules. I have a plaque wow. for it. It's right on the wall. I know you did that. I ain't get one. That's my point. You know what I'm saying? So it just. I need it, one for the studio. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I got it. I have it. So my point is like, that, yeah. that, you know, and I was just, I was in LA and Luke kept calling me like, yo, I'm at the studio. Come by. You know, when he was in his yeah. Luke mode. And I'm like, all right. So he's sitting down and Ben Billions is over there. Yeah. The drum machine. So I'm like, all right, cool. So Luke's like, hey, someone take the other guitar. I'm like, what's he doing? All right. So I take a guitar and I start playing a line that he's playing something. Then I told the intern to get my bass. I play a couple of things. Cool. I leave. I guess it was a Yo Gotti session or something. Yeah. He was making beats. And then I guess Teron must have come in and wrote a hook. Yeah. And next thing you know, hey, Doja's going to do the hook. Cool. And the next thing you know, big up Sam or RCA. Sam was like, oh, that record you did for Doja's banging. I'm like, <laughs> shout out to Baby Sam. When I did a record. For Doja. <laughs> when I did a record for Doja. So then I get a contract and I'm like, who's this person on here? Yeah. Who, who, Luke, do you know who Tyson Beats is? Yeah. I might. And I'm like. That's such a Luke response. <laughs> so I produced the record. I just played the bass line and, and then left. I, I, okay. You know, it is what it is. It's a beautiful record. Big yeah. Doja. Smash. But my way. point is, I never saw it. So you get into spaces and you kind of don't know where it's all landing, mm. where it's coming from, and anything else. But on the creation level. It always works out when you just keep planting good seeds. You can keep going I back agree. up that block yeah. later. Every day. All those things could happen. You figure it out. You see what's happening. And for me, I just realized 
there's other stuff for me to do. So mm. I retired my production career mm -hmm. because if I left it up to everybody else, I would do nothing else. You'll be out Quincy life. Jones. You'll be doing working on Thriller right now. And I probably will. Just, you know, if you made Jay-Z, make another one, right? Yeah. So I retired yeah. Salam on my 50th birthday. Mm. And then. little 12 inch pieces of art mm -hmm. that have a musician in yeah. it and that then I oh I could put epoxy on it so I can mm. basically develop a little style. Yeah. Mm. That keeps going. Um I'm seeing different things, seeing different ways I can create pieces. And I also did a super cat art piece and I did you mm. know, now I'm putting my stars on it. Yeah. Like making bigger ones and it develops and goes through it. Eventually it develops to where I'm also adding audio system so mm -hmm. but me being a producer it got to sound crazy so mm. now we have all these unique art pieces i have about um 35 of them here in buckhead in atlanta mm -hmm. from next until like march 2nd we'll this is art pieces that you made yourself so the museum for me was i can't sell pictures of nas without paying nas it's my boy mm. i can't sell pictures of amy winehouse without paying them so what i did was I went to the Marley Estate and to Marvin Gaye's Estate, which I worked closely with both of them, mm. and said, for name and likeness alone, how much would you want to get paid? We came to a percentage that would be 40%. Normally, <laughs> with the gallery, a gallery takes 40 to 50%. Guess what? The person in the picture is the gallery. Mm. If he takes a picture of you and you go inside a museum, you got to get paid. Yep. That's Exactly. And approve it, yep. like the artist, because mm -hmm. it's your face. And I also will call you and ask you, can you approve? Juju is going to buy this Ray picture. Do you want Juju to buy a picture of you? Mm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. fire. Mm. So that's the way the museum operates on the So we can buy the artwork. So you can buy the artwork. It's, you know, it's up there. Let's go. You mm. know what I'm saying? It's in those things. But in the artwork pieces, I've been able to have the cellular crews, the state and Kane and Rakim and different things. But it was really me treating a intellectual property for name and likeness the way that we should treat everything else. The same way you treat publishing, your yep. clearance. If I don't I like agree. the way you use my song, you can't use it. So 
with this intellectual property now becoming more valuable to people, I was hoping it would inspire them not to so quickly sell their publishing yeah. and their master rights. Mm. Yeah. Because ultimately, this is value that's been created that other people want your value. Yes. Because when the monetary system goes away, it's still of value. Yes. Value and money are not the same thing. I always say that. Right. So then when you have their value and it's actually there, it's of value to you because it means something to you. Yep. And in the bigger scheme, the pieces are one of a kind. The only things to say. So my museum space in Miami was me making my own gallery where all these artists have come together and allowed me to use their name and likeness to create pieces. We also make one of one, one of one art pieces on the wall. Then we do one of a hundred hoodies that kind of go along with it. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Hoodie on today, but we have a lot of different things on that level. Then in addition. Um, you know, I'm also using it as a place. Yeah. Like, I look at it like the Coliseum, I mm. say. Whereas then you walk in there, and then now you will discover a brand new artist. Yep. So if you said, I want to buy some black art right now, where do you go to look? You're not sure where to get it. And it's not only black art, it's everybody's art, but it's black art because <laughs> I, I picked it. Yeah. So that's what it's going to be. But when it comes down to it, you know, I'm giving, so right now what I have in Miami is a, a thing I call original frames, mm -hmm. where it's all brand new artists that I just met that was saying, I can't get into Wynwood. I can't get a gallery to pick up my stuff. Mm -hmm. So now a museum is something that you'll see in different places. Oh, that's You're going to have it different places around the world, different places in the country. Whereas then you'll see the Bob Marley piece, but you also might see a piece that you may write next to it. And it just depends yeah. on how and and, and And it becomes, I also think what I like is that our music business needs more collectibles. Like, mm -hmm. that's one thing sports has done that has made them... It's like, I have a John Starks jersey in my house on the wall. My son wasn't... My son was born in 08. He didn't even know what John Starks is. Mm -hmm. But sports memorabilia makes you see the importance of it. So, I like... I always tell artists, I'm like, exactly. the way we look at everything is art. Like, people might say, I bought a letter that Tupac wrote Jada when he was in jail. Like... That shit's gonna be worth some three hundred years from now. You know, I think you're doing a good job of that. Um, you've been to the hip hop museum down in um, the black, oh, it's African African American Music Museum in Nashville. No, I haven't been there yet. So they, I bought a, like a Jimi Hendrix guitar. Like they had like a, a memorabilia of Jimi Hendrix guitar. Mm -hmm. I bought that, put that on the mantle. Uh, they had like a, a couple like coffee table books, like yeah. portraits that like from, from some Swiss Beats collection. Mm -hmm. Like, but no, nah, I think you that we definitely need more collectors. Yeah, and and, if, and bigger than anything else. I'm not even selling the art and all the pieces. We are selling that, but I'm I'm also giving away the inspiration. I'm hoping that somebody does tell a story job because my job in this space was to create a platform for people to now be able to show their intellectual property and have an audience to now send it to. Mm. So it wasn't really about you know what I got from working for Doug Morris was that I didn't walk into there and just say this is what I need for my label. Yes, that's not what happened. I had to go to him and say, well, this is what I think I can use, but this is how we can structure it so that the whole building can use it. Yes. So when we went and I had the Mac Wiles album, the whole RAL Rush, you know, Red Associated label or whatever was built, was built that Luke had records there, the cast from Sweden, Judd, Doug had, because I had to figure out how to build something that was stronger. And now that's gone down to the museum aspect for me. Mm. Museum is somewhere that I can also get attention for my personal art. Yeah. But the goal wasn't that. 90% was me, 10% was other people. Now it's going to be 90% other people, 10% percent 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 you. Me. Because now I broke a brand. Yep. That now this is when you go there, you know that this is actual validated art from the real artists, right from the real people. And now that actually can open up a whole nother space for people to be able to generate income as creators. That's beautiful. I just say one thing. Hold on, so hold on one second. Go ahead. You probably don't know this, but shout out to Mac Wiles. 2018, 2019 is when it, like we came in to contact with each other through Mike Brinkley. Matt, you sent Mac down to Atlanta and he came uh, and recorded with us. And that's where remember. So remember. exactly shout out and that's when I found breaks. out Mac's first video had Cardi B in it. Crazy. His first ever video Cardi B's dancing in his video. What was See? that on it? Own it? You did own it, right? Yeah, I did own it, but is she, she's an owner? She's, she's actually in it. If you go back and look at the video, she's actually See, you didn't even know you was giving opportunities. There's opportunities everywhere. Mm. Well, she in nail. she was in Henny. She was in Henny. She, she was in Henny. Henny. Oh, video. so you know. You, right. showed her. I, you know, I was going to tell you. <laughs> nah, but I, I was going to just, I was going to tell you that the, the, the one thing that you're doing that I think that people, if we all understood this, we all, the world would change. Everybody is trying to find a way to get the light shined on them. 
like that's what everybody like, shine a light on me. Like everybody want to be seen. And I figured out, I know you already been know, the power is in shining the light. Cause now you are the source. Yeah. So for me, I rather me shining the light makes my light brighter. And yeah. you get that. And that's what people don't get. And if more people thought like that, we would, the world would be better because it wouldn't be selfish now. Now to be like, I can't wait to tell the world what you did. And you can't wait to tell the world what I did. But if I tell you and you see everybody look at me, you just killed it. You just killed the love train. Like, I'm sending you love. You send somebody else. Everybody send each other love. Mm-hmm. If you stop and be like, yeah, I am the best, you just killed the love train. Yeah. And right now, what we need more than anything is the love train. People who are, like, celebrating each other. Because I do think that this is the first time in history that we don't really know what the future looks like. Like, we don't know if the music business is going to be the same as it was 10 years ago, like 10, 10 years from now. We don't know what a and jobs is going to be. We don't know nothing. Artists don't even know if they're going to be selling records from now. So with that being said, the only way we can avoid that is by shining a light on each other constantly. Salam got a, a museum. Go buy your art. Cool. Once you get to his museum, by the way, Ray got this. You should go do this. And now we, it's like we sending, we sharing with each other. Yeah, we creating the light. So exactly. for me, I just want to tell you, I appreciate that. But we about to play. Oh, go big, ahead. I'm sorry. Big, big up Jason Jeter because, you know, he actually has a space, Heavy Market, that, um, you know, is in Buckhead. And he's actually... Heavy Market and Salon presents the music. Oh, for real? Oh, that's so, fine. Right there, right there in the Buckhead um, in yeah, Shops yeah, at Buckhead. Gallery. He has, he has Buckhead Gallery. Space. It's going to be in, uh, what's it, 3115 East Shadow Lane. Shout out to Jason Jeter. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, think we, I think we... Buckhead pre- Shops. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I said. Shops at Buckhead. Shops. Exactly. We, but it's, it's going to be in another space. Got gotcha. you. So, you know, so, I'll put it up on. So now we're about to play Making the Cut. That's mm. fun time. What's good, everybody? This is Ray Daniels, a.k.a. The Culture Referee. And if you were wondering who this beautiful woman sitting next to me is, is my sister Tiffany Daniels Sai. Let's give it up for my sister. Everybody can clap. This is good. And my sister is, she's the most talented person in the family. And we started a family business, a signature scent company. So if you like smoke a lot of weed in your car and you want to get the scent out, you have to check out these scents. I know guys that use it for the weed. I know people that use it for cologne and everywhere they go to get compliments. We make candles. We make room sprays. We got them in kits. So if you want to buy something for your loved one or anybody, you know, that you care about, Hit us up, LorraineCo.com. And we're going to put the website at the bottom of it. Uh, but support this black business. Support this black woman. And order, I promise you guys. As a matter of fact, use the word gods and we'll give you 15% off. I just made that up. So if my sister <laughs> face looks crazy, don't get mad at her. I'll eat that. But guys, when I tell you this shit is incredible, you really should check this out. The best sense ever. LorraineCo.com. And we'll put it at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Thanks. So I, I wanted to ask you, like, um, <clears throat> we've had, like, a lot of conversations on here, um, specifically about, like, New York and just different things. And I just, like, just, you know, going through this interview and just listening to you talk, I just, I got to just, just a couple of things I want to ask. Um, who would you say are, like, your top five producers of all time? Hmm. Um, top five. And I'm going to take the order away from them. Just, you know, put it into what it is. Uh-huh. Monk Higgins is a big influence on me. Monk Higgins was a guy that I sampled a lot, but I always loved his balance of rhythm and melody and orchestration. So he's an old jazz musician. Monk Higgins is a core producer for me. Uh, Barry White. Mm. Barry White with the balance of <laughs> That's why I said we should have waited. Just we redo this whole segment. Re slate this. Right, no, it's cool. Hold Barry. on, what I miss? All right, let's go. Let's go. Jack asked a question. I heard Jack yeah. say I gotta ask him and then I see everybody lost. <laughs> he asked him his top five producers. Yeah, I asked him um who did, who did who were his top five producers period oh that's hard man. that's cool I'm, I'm gonna give you five though so monk higgins is number one um this is not in order but you know the first one i'll say is monk higgins dope you know i'll always loved his uh balance of rhythm and uh, orchestrations mm-hmm. he did a lot of songs that we sampled and also his own records but monk higgins is one uh barry white 
same thing. The balance of rhythm being really poignant and then also um, melodic stuff. Mm-hmm. Molly Mall. That's a good the one. The father of, like Hip-hop I said, how I came into this. <coughs> it was really important for um, what, did he, what he brought to the overall energy to it. Um, I definitely have to give Quincy props for his ability to bring the uh, pristine arrangement into different eras. You know, what he learned from the Big Band era and applying it to the R&B made, <coughs> excuse me, made R&B even better um, at the times when he was able to pull the pieces through. That's four. Yep. Yeah. Quincy, Molly Maul. Monk Monk Higgins and Barry White so far. And I'm going to go to Sly and Robbie, the rhythm twins Mm, out of Jamaica. That's that's a good one. What they were able to push through rhythmically and what it, you know, applied to on a global level. Dopeness. I just want to say one thing about Barry White, and you could correct me. It's just my interpretation. Barry White is one of the rare artists who produced all his music and didn't write none of it. Mm. Am I tripping? I know he's a producer. He produced all his music. What do you mean? He wasn't the actual songwriter and composer? He didn't, no, he composed. He didn't write it down. He didn't write the lyrics that he sung. So playing your game, ba- like somebody else wrote those lyrics for him. I don't know about that. I'm, that's what I'm saying. I, I, that's my I interpretation. Nah, no, actually, Barry White didn't, he would hum the melodies to his arranger to, inspire, yeah. to, to do whatever the arrangements were. But as far as I know, he did write a lot of that stuff. A lot of that stuff, he's the only writer, not only for himself, but for Love Unlimited, et cetera. Barry White is core. There's a dope book and documentary, Love Unlimited. His documentary is part of mm-hmm. one of my biggest inspirations that I love. His whole story, he was, it actually, there's a documentary that has his voice on it. He's mm-hmm. telling the story, mm-hmm. and it kind of goes most of his life until yes. he, when he was sick. So he talked about a lot of different stuff, you know, him and his brother and walking from South Central to Sunset Boulevard and all types of stuff to kind of getting into it and his decisions not to go back into gang life. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I didn't Where, know that. You know, he had that, that, that brother that kind of was like still that thing. Um, you know, when he's 14, his voice dropped. That was really dope. And then also um, his book. There's a book called Love Unlimited. It's one of my favorite I was going to say, this is my, this is my, right here, this this beat right here, bro, I can't lie. I'm just going to play it for y'all. Like, I didn't know that. This sounds like Barry White. And I didn't know it was, I didn't oh, know he produced it. That's Love Stain. Love Stain, yeah. exactly. So, I don't know if he actually wrote Love Stain. No, there's no lyrics on it. Oh. That's what made me say, like, because I didn't know this was Barry White. But there's no lyrics on the song. Yeah. So it's just a beat. But I'm like, damn. It, and by the way, it's one of the greatest composers ever. And it was no beat. It, but it sounded like Barry White. And then I did mm-hmm. some more research and he produced it. I was right, like, then right. I started doing more research, looking into his catalog, and I'm like, damn, it would say written by, and then it would say produced by him, written by these. So I'm like, damn, yeah. like, but his voice was the tool. His voice was so His voice unique. was the tool, but more, more than anything else, like you said, imagination. Yes. You know, his, his way of putting the rhythm, like I, said, I have a thing where it's, it's like Chris and Crony, if it's Jamaican style. Like, I love records that you can get up and do your bop to, you got that heavy bass and it's bumping, but also melodically, it's just the sweetest thing you could have at the same time. So that's a lot of, if I'm in my element, that's what my records sound like. It's mm. The groove is really in pocket, but the melodies is hitting you in a place where you feel like you're in a dream. Mm. What, what would you say is your, just your personal favorite record that you've ever done? Mm. That changes, I don't know if I have. What is it today? Um. I actually haven't wanted to listen to a lot, a lot of my stuff recently. There's an album I did called The Champagne Flutes. I've been playing that a lot this last week. Hard. Um, and The Champagne Flutes is myself and Terry Walker from London. That same prog energy I was on. Yeah. Mm. It's orchestrations. But it's, it's like music with champagne. Like it's like, it's that champagne makes it sexy. Like it just. It's just us in a zone. And she was in a, a zone where she'd done records in London. And I just did what I felt like it. I think. What I like more than anything else is having the idea and then executing it. But the albums that I did, all my do it for the culture stuff is really where I really got what I wanted to come through and chill. The um, No Ponte, which is Joel Ortiz, Nitty Scott, and Bodega Bams. I just have an idea and I make whatever I feel like it. 
that's when I'm happiest. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you're being culture. true to yourself. Yeah, I'm just making it because I feel like it. Like, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no, we're going to make money. This going to be, like, I'm I just expressing that. myself. When I listen to certain records, I hear me. Mm-hmm. That's, that's pretty much. You're staying authentic. Mm-hmm. You're, you're doing what you tell artists to do. Be your most authentic self. And that's how you win. It's like this pot of food that I want in my house. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This is the art that I want on my wall. All yeah. the art that I personally make yeah. is stuff that I would want on my own personal wall. I can't make what you want. That's and fine. then the music I post, you know what I'm saying? When I post music online, I'm reminding my other creators that 30 seconds can change someone's entire mentality. Entire. Mm. Change their whole vibe. That's so big. that's our job. Change their whole family. Something. Change their family's life. The, the perception of them, it all changes. 30 seconds. But when you hear something and people go to my page, and on Sundays I do this thing called Sunday Shuffle. Yep. People like, oh my gosh, this feels like this whole vibe. I'm just, I got all records on my phone. I'm, by, just, by I'm, way, I got, I'm just loving what I do. I just got to say something. Salam Remy is a real person. <laughs> he is yeah. not a blog. Because his page is being followed by music lovers all around the world, and they don't know. He's like the greatest record shop. But they think that the they world. think that Salam Remy is a company. I'm like, no, no, that's an actual person. He, mm. I know him, and he's just a music lover, so that's why he posts mm. the music that he loves. But the way you cornered that, love that. Right. Like, and then you be finding the most unique shit. Like, when you, it's, it, was a a, it, it was a clip you posted of, like, it was one of you posted, like, I think Michael Jackson. It was some, I never saw that performance in my life. And I'm like, how the fuck does he find this? Searching, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's part of what it is. Like, if we can get those things and actually feel it, you know. Once again, I'm a student. Is that right? Okay. Where, where can we go for it? Can we actually hear something? And once, when you hear that record, mm-hmm. when you hear that thing and it changes your whole vibe, you know, you just, so then all I'm doing is just reminding people. This is the stuff I want to listen to. And mm. I'd rather um, have that. And you know, I've been doing that since, what, 2017 now? So that's seven years. You know, if I can have that be the first thing people talk to me about when they see me, hey, man, I like that music you post. And cool, get out my business. <laughs> yeah, put, put you where I want you. <laughs> exactly. That's why I posted over there for y'all. No, exactly. exactly. That exactly. was my way of being around y'all, but not having to be around y'all. Nah, not the inside of my house. Yes. And what am I doing in here? Yeah. I'm going to post what I want you to talk about. Of course. So so now we're about to play Making the Cut. So I'm about right. to start off. So in this game, we give you three options. You got to cut one, dun, 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 dun. sign one, <laughs> develop one. Cut one, uh, sign one, develop one. And if you choose not the answer, it's that donate to the Creative Academy. It's a nonprofit that we've partnered with. Uh, and... Two of the kids have actually won Grammys. Like, mm. the, the guy who runs it is a guy that uh, I work with, and I've signed two producers from there. So right. it's a real program. But let's get into it. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start easy. I'm trying to give you, like, 8 to 10. I'm going to start easy, though, because I gave you this one already. Biggie Life After... No, Biggie Ready to Die, Jay-Z Reasonable Doubt, Nas, okay. Illmatic. And what are my choices? You got to sign one. You got to uh, put one in development, and you got to drop. drop one. This ain't even right. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I think I'm just, you know, the kids going to get a little change. Kids going to get, <laughs> now we know they got pizza, that. guys. We know they're going to get and, pizza. And, and a slice of pizza is $20. I'm going to tell you reality is that. One pet, one, they all get a Ill, pizza. Illmatic is inspiration to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes I hear records. Yeah. And, you know, those are dope. But it was my actual inspiration. Yeah. The way Elmatic was done. Um, Biggie's Ready to Die was a development. After an Elmatic happens, was a development of how different things could actually spread from that. Yes. And twice as long, more commercial in certain aspects, suicidal thoughts. It was necessary. He, he, he was born on it. the first song, died on the last song. It was, just, it was, just, it was, it was, it was the expansion of what Illmatic brought to us, yes. you know what I'm saying? Because I had them on cassette before they both came out. Mm. So that was there. And Reasonable Doubt was Jay-Z getting the chance from, even he though he had you know, different features with Can I Get Open and Kane and Jazz and other things before that, it also was his birth into what we now had as the greatest example of frontline player, actual person who is frontline talent to executive to forming a company that meant something. Mm. Meaning that we're you no know, Oprah Winfrey, oh, you just do the news, girl. No, I'm actually 
Oprah, the network. Yes. There's Bill Cosby. There's Magic Johnson. Oh, you just bounced the ball. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm actually going to be the business behind yes. the ball even getting bounced or not. I love so that. So Jay-Z is hip-hop's example of that Everything happening. Be. But also the time when he got in, he wasn't a teeny bopper. He was also a grown man who had to put some, together something that was there. And what he was able to do as far as now having his network grow. So you can't play with any of those records because they all either inspired each other, which they did, because yeah. Reasonable Doubt's first single came off of Hillmatic. Yeah. So, yep. if you came cut, up, yep. so if you cut Hillmatic, I'm off of Dead no Presidents re- represent as real. Yeah, no, that's you know crazy. I never thought about that. All right. That's so, why I like talking so, to so, you. So, so, so then, and then when you line them all up, it was they all absolutely necessary for the evolution. I love that. All right, I'm make, now it's going to get harder. Mm. Okay. I'm gonna get hard. I'm gonna, this is actually the hardest one I usually end with, but I'm going to start because I got a whole way I'm going to go with you. Jay-Z, Kanye, Drake. Like, how do you do that? It's all the same thing. <laughs> that's the hard. By the way, that's the hardest one. Then I'm going to get to the real hard one. That, that, that don't even make no sense. Because, <laughs> you know, without the Jay-Z, is there a Kanye? Right. Okay. And then... Without the Kanye and the Ada Race and Heartbreaks and the well, I'm, I'm glad you're going just, there. Go there. I'm more than just an option. Does Drake get the opportunity to break that? Because he was already going in a different direction. But that who was that? Find my love. Yep. Without find my love, does I he get the opportunity to open up what he did for twenty other records that was actually there? And he was able to refine and do something else. Him and Forty had already created their own style. Yeah. And you know, I love Drake bars when he's in bars mode. Yeah. But in all the other stuff, but yeah, them kids are getting some bread. Forty dollars for the kids. Forty dollars for the kids. I got one for you. Right, okay, okay, I got go one ahead. for you. And it's gonna be hard too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doug Morris. Ooh. L.A. Reid. Sylvia Rome. <laughs> Same difference. You can't do that. Number one. Um, without Doug Morris, there's no, there's no Sylvia Rome for nope. sure. And the way, no, no, Sylvia exists, but you know, that was her mentor that gave her East West Records so that she can be the CEO boss she continues to be to these days. And then what Doug was able to do with LA, even on the universal level with IDJ, and then again at Epic, you know, you, nah, you can't. The yeah. kids? Thanks. How much these kids? Sixty dollars so far. <laughs> all right, all right, it's the cool, best thing that cool, happened to right. That's why this is beautiful because nobody wins but the kids. This, if you don't want to ask, this, this is called a. There's a feelings budget. You know it's all good, but you know, but but this ain't even my feelings. It's just the truth. Like the truth. No, but is that's why. To be honest with you, I enjoy asking you because you gave me a perspective that I didn't even yeah. think about. Yeah. So like, damn, you're right. But I, that's why I like talking to you because you give me perspective that I don't think. All right, let's get into it. LL Cool J, Nas, 50 Cent. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I want to ask you, if there was any artist you could work with now. Let's wait to after the cut then. Let's wait to after making the okay, cut. Making cut. I want to finish it because I got like four or five more I want to get over and then I want <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure we don't lose. Right. LL Cool J, Nas, 50 Cent. All Queens. By the way, where you're from? Nah. Nah, that's still going to have to be. Yeah, these kids getting. Kids. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I mean, let me tell you why. All right, first things first. LL Cool J. LL Cool J was our first embodiment of the rap superstar. It's almost like what Beyonce is now to, oh wow, it's Beyonce embodies all these different elements and it's Beyonce. LL Cool J, yes, we had Spoonie G, yes, we had Kumo D, yes, we had. Curtis Blow, but LL Cool J was I Need Love, but also at the same time, he was Jack the Ripper. He was also bad. He was also bad. He was also, Ooh. it was like, you know, I'm punching, mama said knock you out. LL Cool J was everything that you needed to have that superstar mode, but he also was I Need a Beat, and he also was the doo-wop, and he also mm. was all the bottom line He was the first things. everything in hip-hop. He was the yeah. first everything artist was, that hip-hop ever experienced. Right. And it was like, you know, Def Jam was the label because of the LL Who J was actually able to be yep. at the core of it. Mm-hmm. So LL Who J set a bar that without an LL Who J, there isn't a Jay-Z. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. So when you look at that, the LL Who J mode of there's no Drake. 
You know what I'm saying? So yeah. Uncle Jay is it. Um, as far as you said, Nas and Fifty, mm-hmm. all queens. Once again, you know, Nas is Nas is one of my best friends, as well as his contribution continues until he don't feel like it, right? So that just keeps going there. I ain't even got to get deep on that. But 50 was also necessary for another reason. 50, um, against the odds, also showed the power of writing. You mm. know, I always say that, you know, 50 Cent, he took Magic Stick, a beat from, you know, I think UMC's produced that, you know. I, mean, I think Hosted from UMC's, but he made something that became a damn condom company. Like, 50's pen, mm-hmm. when he feels like it, when he's on it, it's great that now he's applying that vision to television, but 50's pen was so important to how he was bringing things forward and what he was actually doing to kind of develop the mold was very, very strong. Um, and, you know, what he's able to do like I said, fifty spin game. It was there. Yes. a lot of beats and different things. Yeah, but you know, so seductive. What he was able to write for game. What he's able to write for. You Hated know, to love it. The Tony Yayo records. Mm-hmm. You know the so seductive and the. I know you don't hey, love me, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, just you in ain't general. The same with so 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 in, in <laughs> general. Don't the Olivia records. He gave Olivia a hit. <laughs> in, in, in <laughs> and, and the thing is, like fifty doesn't necessarily make a lot of records right now. That landing. But I never count him out because he has a pen and that means he can always find the pocket when he's inspired to do so in the right way. Him and Mr. Cheeks is two people that I'd be like, if you give him a beat and that beat bopping, he going to find a bop and it's going to mm, go. I love that. It just that. depends on what he picks. All right, I got a couple more, man. Because uh, no, no, we, no, we have 80. 80? Right, I don't want to. Uh, all right, so a couple more. Ooh, that's a good one. Damn, these last few. I'm going to give you three more. That's it. Uh, Biggie, Pac. X, DMX. Once again, this is, you know, without the Pac energy, they have no X. Big doesn't develop the same way. Mm. Mm. Damn, I didn't yeah. think about Big, that. Big develops, but Big doesn't develop the same way. Yeah. He didn't you think about the saying? chicks. He was a dirty MC. Pac made him see that the chicks could bring More than it. that, even also the death stuff, you know, speaking about death in the same way. Yes. You know what I'm saying? There's certain lines, it's all good, baby, baby. Like, certain yeah. stuff that kicked hey, in, you know, in a different way. And Big and Pac played off of each other. You yes. Know, there was a friendship there. There was a whole nother energy. So Big and Pac were definitely, you know, their own thing. And then X took what that was to another space, you know. Mm. X being able to rip down a stadium with a prayer. Like, what are we doing? Like, X's passion was something else. So that's definitely, like, you know. this. And the problem is, I could say the sign and develop – any of them. Yeah. But I can't find a cut. You know what I'm saying? That's the hard part. You got to say, you got to ask your physical, you got to say cut. cut. You might land on somebody and I'd be like, ah, he can go, but you ain't, you ain't got there yet. I got two more. You kind of avoiding the names that I would No, cut. no, I got two more. I'm giving you names. You ready? All right, cool. Amy Winehouse, Lauren Hill, and Whitney Houston. Right here. That's so where you going. Like, um... <laughs> <clears throat> First, I got the opportunity one time to ask um, Lauren Hill, like, you know, I'd never got, you, you're doing this with me, but I was like, so who are the singers that you liked? Yeah. And her overall answer, she named a bunch of people, but she was like, anointed voices mm. was her <laughs> phrase that she like gave Whitney. me. And Whitney was one of them. But, you know, ultimately, what Whitney's been able to do, Whitney didn't necessarily write her record but how she delivered her records and what it came from and where it went to can be questioned. And, you know, for that, it inspired everyone else. Agreed. Including the Lauren Hill, including an Amy Winehouse, you know, across the board. So, you know, yeah. All right, last one. I don't, I don't, I don't think you're going to get this one, but this is this the hardest one to me. The score, the miseducation of Lauren Hill, back to black. I mean, those are all essential albums. Those are all that you've been. You played a huge diamond, role in Diamond, you know, plus albums. I actually didn't do anything on Miseducation, but you know, the inspiration was there um, for me. But yeah, those are all 
stellar, necessary records that inspired their entire generation. You know what I'm saying? That's, like, that's real. Like the scores blend, and they all they all own the point in time. Like oh, yeah. they all own the moment in time, and they were the soundtrack for that moment. I don't even know if they created the moment or they made it for the moment, but that moment when Amy yeah. Winehouse dropped. Every black girl I knew was calling me like, have you heard this girl? She's a white girl. And I heard her voice. I'm like, who the fuck is this? When I heard rehab, I'm trying to get to go. Like, but they all have one thing in common. They all are honest. And to me, I feel like if, if it was one takeaway from this entire interview, it's be your most authentic self at all times and be okay with the outcome of that. Mm, yeah, I, I, you can't lose. I agree. You can't, you can't so, lose by being yourself, but... The score was also, what was dope about the score was that it was CD days. Yes. So in one household, you might have five score albums. Yep. Because you don't want to buy, because you don't want your brother, sister, your brother. Your sister, like mad people got the same album. You ain't got that one? And you know, because why? Yeah. They're pulling off and they cars in opposite directions. Yeah. And they all got the CD. So the score was actually like, ching, 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 ching. Like <laughs> in the whole other level. And of course, miseducation was, like I said, it was a growth of this is how we can express uh, that space. But then, you know, Back to Black was there. But the Frank album also was a whole nother level for Amy's fan fans. Mm -hmm. And then Back to Black also, you know, gave it <clears throat> the huge moment. But it's always like a thing where it's like, is it off the wall or Thriller? Wh wh which one you got? Is it? Oh, I got a question for you. So hold on, I'm asking okay. you. Okay. <laughs> hold on, like, what'd you say? You off the wall or Thriller? You off, off the wall, wall for me. Right, so that that's my point. And if it's off the wall, then you understand that Thriller was necessarily to take it all away, but without that off the wall, would there be a Thriller? But, but by the way, off the wall, I want to be starting something should have been off the wall. It didn't, they, it didn't feel like Thriller. But they had to get the Thriller. They, I'm just saying, but want to be starting something, something that sounds like off the, off the wall. Right, but you had to yeah. keep something on Thriller that felt like how you felt on off the wall. Question. I just got to ask you this. We done with making a cut. We already know what it is. Now I got some questions. Purple Rain, Thriller. Which one is a better album to you? This is not about culture. I'm not asking your personal opinion. Which one of those two albums is better to you? Can we start with the difference between them? You can, but I want you to give me, I want you to give me an answer. Go ahead. Um, Thriller <laughs> is a record that had videos. Yes. Ooh, I love where you're about to go. Purple Rain is a movie Bro. that had a soundtrack. Apollonia. <laughs> right? So, so, so. He's so smart, bro. I just love. I just one love thing it. is wagging the other. Without the Thriller album, Michael killed videos one by one. But this movie that was so necessary for us to understand who Prince was. Yeah. Now had songs on it that actually opened you up to go. Oh, and there's songs that I can walk away with me understanding who this person is. And, and, I'm, and not to cut you off, but it's something very important to factor in. People don't know, Prince was an R&B artist. He was doing Do Me Baby, and he was doing what the label wanted him to do. And then Purple Rain was kind of his, like, this is who I am. But it was also, um, one time I was speaking to, I think I was speaking to Michael Austin. And he was like, Prince had a deal where they did like three albums firm and he could produce it. Mm -hmm. So those first three Prince albums had a lot in it. There was a song I discovered the other day called Crazy You that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. The chord changes on Crazy You are pretty much the chord changes to Between the Sheets, I Like It by DeBarge. Oh, wow. Um, just the two of us and about 90 other R&B records that pretty much took those same chords. Yeah. And I've been trying to find where prior to Crazy You, this, this little turnaround on it actually kicks in. So for all those musician heads out there, listen to Crazy You and tell me what prior to Crazy You has those chord changes. Because I can name a gazillion records after it. And it's an acoustic guitar thing. And for me to realize that Prince did something in, I believe that was 78, mm -hmm. that actually kicked in and became all those R&B records. I mean, like people you know what I'm slipped on him. People don't understand. He, his label didn't want to push him. So when Do Me Baby came out, another woman sung it, and it became a hit for her, for what was he it? Was, um, was champagne, Evelyn Champagne. No, that, that was Melissa Morgan. Melissa Moore, yeah, Melissa Morgan. But that's what I'm saying. Like that was a hit for her. And I remember trying to figure out like who did it first. And I was talking to a music guy. I was talking to Damon Thomas, and Damon was like, "Nigga, 
Prince ain't never sung nobody shit if it wasn't his. Anything Damn. Prince did, it was always the original. Did you hear about Prince and Rick James not being like not getting along when they went on tour? Oh, uh, that they stole his keyboard. He stole Prince's keyboard. They made, made Super Freak was it. I mean, that, that was one of the- <laughs> he, stole, he stole the keyboard and remade. That's how he made Super Freak. That was one of the crazy things that I was talking to Amy about, you know, in those years when Prince was doing, I think, the O2 Arena, and he would sing her song, Love is a Losing Game. And I'd be like, yo, Prince is singing your song. She's like, I'm trying not to think about it. Like, it's throwing me off. Like, mm-hmm. how is- Prince singing a cover uh, of my, my song. song on stage, like, and everybody sings Prince covers, and he's appreciating the, the lyrics and how it's written. Then, even recently, last year when I did a concert with Rakim, he told me that he listens to her song Cherry, and he wanted to talk to me about, you know, her song Cherry, and that he re- Amy reminded him of his aunt Ruth Brown. But just the fact that Rakim, you know, appreciated the rock, yeah, that's the how Amy lyrically like wrote a song. I'm like, Amy. uh when she's in here somewhere, <laughs> um, <laughs> Prince and Rakim like the way you write. That's crazy. So for me, being somebody who is, you know, a mentor to her writing in the first place, that's a, I'm like, all right, that's dope. That's like coaching Tom Brady. Like, damn, like, I. Because that's really where it's at. It's, it's about how many people can I say something to that are going to go and do something that's great on the other side. So the question still is, Purple Rain and Thriller. <laughs> Today, I'm going to go uh, Purple Rain. Mm-hmm. Me too. Oh, th- But you're right. Today, it's almost like an age. I think Purple Rain is just so much more superior than everything Prince has ever done. Like, if you say Purple Rain off the wall, I'd have a problem. Nah, because Doves too. Cry, I'd have a problem. My brother, me too. Brother. No, me but too, at the end bro. of the day, when Doves Cry is still one of how, when I tell songwriters, like, how what are we talking about? Like, I, I try to give people a broad perspective, but let's really stop here. Maybe I'm like my father too cold maybe i'm like my mother she's never satisfied mm. how'd he get in my house <laughs> he was like, like, bro he how'd was he get in everybody's house right. why do we scream at each other this is what it sounds like when those cry and then just to go wait a minute there's no baseline here no baseline <laughs> and then go oh you find out there was a baseline and then i was watching one of the interviews with the engineer and she was like he was just like you know what mute the bass track I'm gonna put it out like this because he did a whole lot of other stuff. And it was perfect the way he did it. But it was just like the way that beat rocks, the way the feel of it is. Time. When those cries, its own thing. But then.
in general, Gary was, you know, the other day, uh, Miss Hill asked me to do a mix on something, and I was like, damn, like, I ain't got G. Like, I, I don't know. I still am going to try, but. You, he know he knows you in and out. It, it's a void. And, and more than knows me, like, we developed so much things. Our careers came up. Most of my, yeah. most of my discography is his discography. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, it was my, really my engineer on a daily basis. Like, you know, I developed so much from 1990 going forward. Um, with G, so Gary's definitely that thing, and then I just, I just gotta throw it back to my pops. You know what I'm saying? I'm At the end of the day, it. yeah, you know, my pops is the blueprint. He is, you know, still he hit me this morning. So what you got going on today? You know, he's still perspective That's on dope. business levels. He's still, you know, he's still. If I'm the oracle, he's still the the microchip mm. that's still making that even possible. That's and hard. you know, he comes to me for things like, Dad, why you ask me a stupid shit? You just got a wise way of kind of, mm. yeah. Of, of, of <laughs> so I ain't got nothing better to do. Like, <laughs> like come on, man. what we doing? But ultimately, you know, he laid out a blueprint that, you know, even at this point, you know, he moved when he was my age to Barbados. I'm moving at my age to Barbados. Like it's still part oh, wow. of what it is. Like at the end of the day, you know, we come from a lineage of um, very sharp business people. Mm-hmm. And he put that into me, but also more than anything else, we ain't got no problem going anywhere, talking to a head of state, talking to anybody, or doing anything because comfortable in my own skin, mm -hmm. comfortable in the space. And I had a direct example. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? The other day I was talking to Nas. We were talking about bridging the gap. And when we made that record, you know, he was like, Ron, you got to remember, you were telling me, you know, if we were thinking about, you know, I never knew my dad. Mother, like people turn down the mother F the fag as yeah. far as talking about their father in the club. Yeah. There's a lot of people that felt like that. Yeah. But, you know, when we both. So that North, is that the, North, the, the Tretch Nutty by Nature record? Yeah. Right? So, Tr so Tretch, you know, that record was a big deal. Yeah. You know, Biggie, you know, Mom Duke left, Pop Duke left, Mom Duke, the attitude, the back weight. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It was just they didn't have, they had disdain for their fathers. Mm -hmm. And when we had the opportunity, originally, originally the record was going to be.
to also be a part of my story. This frequency is now turning around and changing that. In the same way in the art world, I'm leaving things on the wall so you can go, who is that? And I need to find out what's the story. It's almost like the hieroglyphics. So I feel like the imagination is what's missing for most of it. And as Ray said, I'm walking around. I feel good. Why? Because my imagination told me it's going to be crazy today. Me too. Mm. Mm. That's my, I, That's I never, I, I couldn't sum the words, but people like, I'm like, bro, I have an imagination and I know you can create one thing today that can change your life tomorrow for the rest of your life. But if you weren't about how you ain't got, mm. you, nah, you got that imagination needs to come to life. And for where I'm at in life is I'm creating portals. Yeah. So I'm just saying, okay, cool. This is the opportunity for me to have a portal that if you walk through here, now you're able to pick up something, you know, and it's kind of like I plant a tree. I don't know who's going to feel the shade. I don't know who's going to eat the fruit. Somebody will. Gotcha. Somebody had to plant the tree. Got you. That's all right. So how many trees can I plant? How many trees can we all plant? Imagine if we all planted a tree, how different the world would because be. Because it's going to be sun and rain and dirt and everything else. Nature's going to happen. Mm. Life's going to happen. Plant so the idea. I, so let, so once we wow, stop, thought about like you know, that. The, the trees got to outlive us, right? That's crazy. I never thought about that. So You're then so right. plant the type of trees you want. I planted 63 trees during the pandemic. Mm. That's beautiful. So we leave the last question up to Dream. Dream asks the last question, and then we're done. Okay, so you're on the God Show, which stands for goats and underdogs. So what would you call yourself, a goat or an underdog? Hmm. I think... Um, I'm a goat disguising myself as an underdog. Mm. That's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. Undersell, over deliver. Yes. I don't want you to be thinking about what I'm doing. I'm watching you. Right. I come from a long line of stick-up kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we. Well, I'll tell you this. I'm going to tell you this, that we don't allow people to sit on this show if they're not goaded. So you are goaded to us. Uh, you've always been one of my favorite people in this shit. You've always been one of my favorite teachers. And I'm grateful that you came and spent a couple hours with us here. Because I'm pretty sure you don't do that. I'm pretty sure. I've never seen it before. So I feel like, I, I, if I'm being honest with you, I feel like this is the God Show's most famous art piece. Mm. Because we have 100 years from now, they're going to be like, he was on race show. I told you. Mm. So I want to tell you, thank you uh, for being on the show. Uh, thank you for being you and all all your contributions. Thank you to our sponsors, to Lost Distribution. Thank you to Tote and Carry. Thank you to KLH2O. And also thank you to Yoko Vaca. But more importantly, thank you to anybody who sat here and watched this. The last thing I ask you to do is just share, subscribe, do anything. The stuff that costs no money helps us keep this going. If you mm -hmm. learn something from this, tweet about it. And this is The God Show. We are out. Mm -hmm.